Good evening, everyone. Professor Inda Ramnarain, Deputy Principal of the University of the West Indies St. Augustine Campus. Dr. Heather Keto, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Professor Jerome Delisle, Director of the School of Education. To all our presenters this evening, members of the media, and to you, our viewing audience, a warm welcome to this highly anticipated event. This is the fifth virtual symposium being hosted by the Faculty of Humanities and Education, School of Education. And it is my honor to help you neg negotiate the symposium this afternoon. But of course, we have lots of hardworking teams supporting us uh, from marketing and communications and from our very own at the School of Ed. So um, hopefully we will have a very successful session today. Our topic today is why do we need more STEM and STEAM education in Trinidad and Tobago? We have a very packed itinerary for you, but we want to hear what you have to say to us. So you can communicate with us by posting your constructive comments and any questions that you may have into the chat in the Zoom um, meeting. We have a team who will be doing their utmost best to capture all your communication for us. And we will also try to attend to as many of your questions as possible. We do have um, two sessions slated for Q&A. And we'll, as I said, try our very best to attend to all of these questions. So, your overwhelming interest in this topic is uh, um, evidenced by your attendance here today in large numbers, and there are many who are still trying to join the webinar. So we hope that we really provide thought provoking ideas this evening on this topic. So just to set a little background because I we have a packed um, itinerary, as I said, globally, there has been a lot of focus on STEM education. There have been issues that uh, surround enrollment in STEM um, curriculum areas, and this affects graduates uh, um, who are skilled in the in STEM areas, and it contributes negatively to um, development socially, economically, and in other ways. Right. So, internationally developmental work has begun to try and address this issue. And there's a focus on capturing, encouraging and sustaining interest in STEM education. Um, interventions that are being used uh, are looking at creative, interdisciplinary, integrated ways uh, to um, develop this interest in STEM education. So right here in the Caribbean, we also acknowledge that there is a need for a strong, skilled STEM workforce community. But we also face challenges, challenges with enrollment in STEM curriculum areas, achievement, and sustained interest in STEM careers. So things are happening here locally as well. We have NIHUS, Caribbean Science Foundation, and corporate bodies like Digicel and Shell, all contributing efforts in this area. But still, more can be done. So this evening, as we continue to embrace our role as knowledge brokers um, here at the UWI, we think that emphasis needs to be placed on building, um, expanding, and sustaining a STEM ecosystem. So you know that in primary school science and high school science, you learned about ecosystems with lots of biodiversity and everybody has a role and everybody contributes to that ecosystem. So in the same manner, STEM requires and STEM education um, requires sustained um, efforts from many stakeholders, home, school, after school programs, community, science centers, corporate bodies, just to name a few, right? So this evening, through our presentations, we hope to get a picture on what may be stemming the tide and how we can steam forward. 
and you're going to hear a lot more about that. So we'll move right into our first presentation. We are happy to have with us this evening, um, Deputy Principal, Professor Ramnarain. Um, Professor Ramnarain, thank you for joining us. Um, um, the principal was unable to attend and we are very happy that you can facilitate us. So just a little background on Professor Ramnarain. He is a professor of ichthyology. And if you didn't know, that has to do with fisheries and aquaculture. Um, Professor Ramnarain began his um, term as deputy principal here at UWI in 2017. He is an expert in aquaculture and fisheries management and has done voluntary work in Jamaica, Guyana, Suriname, Nepal, Bangladesh, Thailand, and Cambo Cambodia. His primary research interest is in aquaculture development and sustainability, working on species um, such as cascadu, tilapia, prawns, shrimp, crabs, oysters, and river conch. He also has a deep interest in fish biology and the development of sustainable fishing methods in Caribbean fisheries. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Uh, Professor Ramnarain. It's over to you, and he will be addressing the UWI and STEM. Thank you very much, Nalini, and, and welcome, everyone. As Nalini would have mentioned, uh, Professor Copeland wasn't able to attend today. An emergency came up, so he sends his apologies, and he has asked me to, to bring remarks on his behalf. So good afternoon, everyone. It is indeed my pleasure to contribute to today's discussions. I do believe that any meaningful discussion on an education system should begin with a well-defined rationale for having an education system. It may seem trivial, even nonsensical, but when one asks the implied question, one is sure to get a wide range of answers. Indeed, Wilona M. Sloan in a 2012 article noted that in the US, over time, education's primary purpose has ranged from instructing youth in religious doctrine, to preparing them to live in a democracy, to assimilating immigrants into mainstream society, and preparing workers for the industrialized 20th century workplace. Vulnerable small island states need a clear definition. I have shared with my colleagues the following. Education is primarily about enabling citizens, all citizens, to survive and thrive, even as they play their roles in sustaining and growing the society, and with an ability to effectively do so regardless of the society's fortunes and its state of health. This requires an education system that addresses the spectrum of possibilities from survival in a crisis to sustainable existence in better times. While I'm an engineer by profession, a typical STEM career, and remember I'm speaking on behalf of Principal Copeland, he is the engineer, I'm a scientist, but this is also, science is also a typical STEM career. It is no secret that I have long been an advocate for a curriculum that more openly and holistically embraces other disciplines, significantly the humanities. I make quick mention here of a quote from a blog in Scientific American by Stephen Ross Pomeroy, entitled From STEM to STEAM, Science and Art Go Hand in Hand. And he says, Nobel laureates in the sciences are 17 times likelier than an average scientist to be a painter, 12 times as likely to be a poet, and four times as likely to be a musician. So while I'm, I'm a scientist, I'm also proud to say that I'm also a painter. I will also quote from Holland Thorpe, who in an Inside Ed article the Entrepreneurial University said that innovation that addresses major problems facing the world requires an understanding of the human condition, an appreciation of human relations that brings different viewpoints to the table and a relentless pursuit of collaboration. The study of the humanities and social sciences is critical to the skills and worldwide view needed by successful entrepreneurs in all sectors." End quote. Our mission, therefore, is really about creating resourceful, innovative, and socially conscious citizen for the future world who is well-versed in science and technology. It underscores the need for STEM education to go even further. 
the work of many of my colleagues in the Faculty of Humanities and Education underscores that diversifying STEM, particularly into STEAM and STREAM, makes education more accessible and inclusive. And while many of the discussions today will underscore STEM education, I'm looking forward to the new perspectives on STEM, underscoring the kinds of innovative multidisciplinary skills required for advancing our teaching and learning. For over 70 years, the University of the West Indies has been a pioneering higher education institute in the region. As a campus, we celebrated our 60th anniversary last year, and this discussion is so timely. Certainly, we continue to use our knowledge and research for the benefit of Trinidad and Tobago, the region, and beyond. Over its history, the UWI has always stepped up to lend support and guidance to Caribbean societies grappling with unprecedented challenges. We are therefore well on the way to becoming a global university rooted in the Caribbean. To realize this goal means underscoring that the challenges of tomorrow are complex and unpredictable. Thus, the learners of today and tomorrow, if we want to create that resourceful, innovative, and socially conscious citizen for the future, require extensive interdisciplinary knowledge and skills. So as we do not yet know what jobs will look like as we progress further into the 21st century, institutions such as ours must be able to equip our graduates with the skills and capacity to think outside the box and with creative solutions. The theme for this panel discussion is also very timely. Our panelists have immense hands-on knowledge and personal experience to share. And while their perspectives are varied, they're all equally relevant and critical. I want to take the opportunity to thank the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Dean Cato and her team for advancing this worthwhile discussion. I also acknowledge the presence of colleagues from the St. Augustine Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Stacy, as we call it, and its director, Professor John Eger. I wish you all a very successful afternoon, the outcome of which will certainly provide recommendations as much for the present as for the future STEM, STEAM, and STREAM in the context of our education system. I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Inher Ramnarain. I think you've really set the foundation for today's um, session, positioning the UE in that STEM ecosystem that we've talk, spoken about uh, and uh, um, referencing uh, aspects of our AAA strategy in adding to North and well it, um, wealth and knowledge creation and um, reducing social inequity. And this can be done to, through our STEM initiatives. Uh, and you've also um, opened the discussion on STEAM, which is a focal point uh, of today's session. Thank you very much, Professor Ramnarain. And we know that you may have to take your leave uh, and we thank you for the time you have spent with us. Uh, so moving right along, we will now move to Professor Agard. Professor Agard is the director of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. He's also the co-chair of a group of 15 independent scientists drafting the 2023 United Nations Global Sustainability Development Report. Today, Professor Agard will share with us um, his thoughts on promoting STEAM. Over to you, Professor Agard. We seem to be having a slight delay. Professor Egard, are you able to join us at this time? He seems to have been, um, he seems to have dropped. 
Okay, so maybe we will move on then and uh, um, we'll come back to Professor Egard's contribution. Um, hopefully he's able to rejoin us. So coming up right now is the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Dr. Heather Keto. She's a senior lecturer in Caribbean history um, as well as uh, her portfolio as Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. She's also the president of the Association of Caribbean Historians. Among other works, she's the co-editor of Beyond Tradition, Reinterpreting the Caribbean Historical Experience. Today, Dr. Cato is going to talk to us about Caribbean creativity and imagination from the humanities. Dr. Cato. It is my pleasure to jump ahead of Professor Egard. I, I, I want to share some ideas about how we can connect STEAM and the humanities and, 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 and I think really bring together a lot of the things that we've been trying to do in our faculty. Now, when we hear about arts and the humanities and STEM and STEAM and STREAM, words and expression come to our minds critical thinking, communication, design thinking, collaborative problem solving, learning from real life experience. Sometimes these are simply described as skills needed for the 21st century. Well, let me say the 21st century has started with a bang. Who would have thought that critical thinking was needed to understand that you must wear a mask to save your life? Who would have thought you needed critical thinking to know that a Zessa party is not a good thing to organize at this time? And who would have thought we needed critical thinking to understand that it is not about any one person, but the collective good? It makes me wonder, all this talk about 21st century skills, could we have lost some of the skills that we had somehow acquired in previous centuries? Our very elaborate development puzzle has so many pieces. It is important, therefore, to put a frame in place. We can put a frame in place when we grapple with the pieces and the precise fit. We can move from STEM to STEAM to STREAM. We can even end up with a 10 letter acronym. But the key that we need to unlock is that door that we keep knocking at. It is a framework, a framework that captures how we ideate and innovate using a Caribbean imagination and sensitivity as our fuel. To me, the heart of our development challenge in the region is this. I am a, I am a historian and I'm going to leave the precise details of the education experts. We must have about However, be clear about the frame. The frame must be informed by our history. We come from a history that we know was characterized by brutality, genocide of the native population, forced labor, economic systems that were really designed to promote the transformation externally, not in the region. We all know this. We say this by rote without really thinking about what it means for our development process today. We need to understand more about the implications of such a base. We must look to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to propel us forward. I am not trying to downplay these areas. They are extremely important and needed. But what are we going to use to unleash our own fire? How do we do it? And when we get that fire going, how do we keep it burning? What further is needed? We have been propelled into different levels of economic growth before. However, it has never proven to be enough. It is not enough just to light the flame from a fire we already have burning. We must therefore re-examine old fires. We need to look at those fires that were once lit. Our economies are based on primary production. The development in Vidjic was that of a periphery, which would serve the needs of the satellite. Thus, historically, 
we produce raw materials which will process elsewhere. Even tourism can be described as another plantation. Thus, from the very onset, our systems were designed to discourage innovation, to discourage independence, to discourage internal development. This was supposed to be the preserve of the developing country, of the developed countries. We have an international system that was put in place to ensure that it was more profitable for us not to manufacture. Think about it. How the centuries of this impact on our approach to innovation? What about our people? With systems like enslavement and indentorship, telling the majority of our population at one time that they were best suited to simple routine tasks, things that did not need much great power. Even with emancipation and the end of indentorship, people who engage in what today we will call self-employment and characterize as using initiative and creativity were discouraged using social, economic, and political policies. They were described as vagrants. Their crops were destroyed. They were even made to pay proportionally more taxes than large planters and proprietors. With independence, we reached a significant crossroads, but we could not find a new part to development. And this is true of the French, the British, the Spanish, it didn't matter whether we got independence through peaceful means or through revolution. It didn't matter whether we went the route of the French and became dependencies of the mother country. Nothing really worked. Yet, other countries have managed to develop. So, is it that our brains are less suited to STEM disciplines that we think have propelled other countries forward? Or is it that we're using the wrong the fuel or engine. What is eluding us? I want to suggest this evening that our real problem is the inability to create our own part. To do this, we need more than STEM. We need to know how the past has shaped our development and how entrenched the issues are. We need to be creative because we need something that is really new. We have never had a system designed for our people. We cannot just keep adding ourselves to systems that were never designed to benefit us. We need confidence in ourselves. We need a Caribbean engine. That engine should be fueled by creativity and innovation, the kind that comes from knowing and understanding ourselves and grounding in our Caribbean context. We need interventions that fully consider our people, our context, our needs. Another important question I might ask, what propelled us in the past? Because in some ways, our accomplishments have been simply amazing. So, even in the midst of enslavement, indentorship, workers managed to find spaces within a system designed to defeat them. We could not have survived without creating a parallel system designed for our benefit. Limited provision grounds, which were located in marginal areas, sprouted into an informal economy. Cultural networks preserved families and empowered communities. Local and regional internal marketing systems thrived. Independence and creativity created parts for upward mobility. We see the rise of local innovations, we master the planting and manufacture of sugarcane and other crops in the Caribbean terrain. Our peasantry led diversification. They introduced the new crops. They ushered in one of our most prosperous periods. Thus, a system based on force and perceived inferiority of the other, we thrived. Why? Creativity, innovation, critical thinking, new forms of communication, all coming from the very heart of our people. Thus, our society survived and even thrived. We did this by creating systems based on our real life Caribbean experience. I want to remind you that we also have a history full of the most creative and impactful thinkers. We have our own Caribbean tradition of intellectual thought, which includes Thomas, James, Naipaul, Walcott, and many others. Their work 
what distinguishes it? It is distinguished by their understanding and use of their Caribbean context. We have our Calypsonians. We have our cultural innovations, the steel pan, carnival hosi. In the middle of the 20th century, our own development terrorists evolved, breaking new ground with their analysis, using history, economics, internal context, and independent thought. I want to remind us that some of this thinking was centered right here at the St. Augustine campus. Williams, Bess, Beckford, Raffith. So what can we learn from our past about what we need to propel us forward? In such instances, innovation was not powered by any global scientific progress. It came from the people. It came from their experiences. It came from their desires, their needs, their capacity, their scope to create. Just imagine, just imagine what may have happened if that innovativeness was backed with the right support structures. What we need to propel us forward in today's world can only be done by mixing the specialized scientific rigor that is needed with a strong blend of history and culture and a heady dose of Caribbean creativity backed by economic, social, and political incentives. I want to suggest that our engine must be fueled by our very Caribbeanness. We must know it, we must understand it. That is why the arts and humanities must be central. Who else can create a design that is needed for the Caribbean? Why are we so afraid to be ourselves? It is also clear to me that the systems we have modeled from the so-called developed world are already showing their flaws in the 21st century. They are cracking up before our very eyes. They also need their own thing. So towards a new frame, I want to suggest the following. We must include arts and cultural studies. They must be seen as academic disciplines with their inbuilt, inbuilt rigor, theories, methodologies, practical components, which must contribute to any development model. We must understand how the intangible feeds our spirit. We must understand how to see the world in our own Caribbean way. We need to investigate how we use art to enhance and foster scientific in activity and inquiry. The value of history and literature cannot be underestimated. They are unique mirrors into ourselves. What insight can they provide into the models for the development that we have used and the relative successes and failures? What analytical skills and sense of civic can they hold? How else do we teach students to discern the truth? How do we teach them to identify the problems in any narrative, even if it's coming from a president? How do we teach them to see inequality in all its forms? Also needed in that frame is Caribbean creativity and innovation. It must be appreciated. But I want to remind us that we are not strangers in this area. We, were, we merely wish to harness them, focus them, and build on them in new ways. My final thought this evening is full of bias. How can we change the trajectory for human beings without the humanities? Think about it. If that becomes our reality, we really have to ask ourselves, who are we really creating this new development model for? Thank you for listening. Back to you, Nalini. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, may I be so forward as to say you may be a historical science and math student. Uh, there's always room for you. You really underscored for us uh, how important it is to have a conceptual understanding of STEM and STEAM and where we want to go. So for those of you just joining us, um, remember STEM refers to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And STEAM is one of its variants. We'll hear a little bit more about it as we proceed with the presentations. But STEAM incorporates the arts. And it is very important for us to understand how 
elements of the arts and the humanities, such as design thinking, critical thinking, innovation, creativity, contribute to STEM skills and STEM skill development. And you've really laid that out for us, Dean. And another important thing coming out of what you shared is the fact that we need to focus on our Caribbean uniqueness and what is needed for us to propel us forward. So um, your, your presentation was well received and we really appreciate the time that you always take to join us on these virtual symposiums. Now, it may have been by design, but uh, um, Dean Keto has jumped ahead of Professor Agard, but I think it is still well placed because having introduced that role of the Caribbean innovation and creativity, um, Professor Agard now has the floor to discuss for us promoting STEAM. I did introduce you, Prof, but I will do so again. Um, Professor Egard is the director of the University of the West Indies St. Augustine Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. He is also co-chair of group of 15 independent scientists drafting 2023 United Nations Global Sustainability Development Report. And Professor Egard is going to share with us um, his thoughts on promoting STEAM. The floor I, is Thank you very much for the introduction and my apologies to everyone. I had some internet failure and that's why I disconnected at the, exactly the wrong moment. Um, okay, so le let me, I'm going to talk from the point of view of a scientist um, the, and talk about what is, you know, STEM and STEAM and so forth and the difference between them. Because we think that the, the inclusion of arts, um, in the teaching even of scientists is quite critical, in fact. Um, so let me just start off by take, talking about, you know, um, STEM first. Uh, Professor Cato already mentioned some of this. That STEM stands for, of course, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And alternatively, STEAM stands for science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. You introduce the arts part. But um, STEM education is more than just sticking to those subject titles together. It's actually a philosophy of education that embraces teaching skills and subjects in a way that resembles real life. Um, I've spoken to uh, a number of um, young people, even um, people in primary school who have come to see me, they had projects and stuff. And they, um, they, they like to be taught in a little bit of a different way in which there is a mixture of things involving case studies, uh, you know, practicality and stuff like this. Um, so so uh, rather than just sticking to, you know, uh, scientific topics in silos, where you're doing maths, physics, chemistry, biology differently, uh, in fact, and not integrating all of these together. And the arts aspect is quite uh, critical as well. So the, why is this STEM education uh, so important? Because it's part of how we need to change the educational system in Trinidad and Tobago. The, the key component of STEM and STEAM is really integration. Instead of teaching disciplines in independent subject silos, uh, lessons should be well-rounded and project an inquiry base with a focus on interdisciplinary learning. Now, in schools, you know, if, uh, they, they, they had for a few years uh, integrated science is how they, what they, what they, they called it. Um, so STEM and STEAM align with the way we work and problem solve in our daily lives, um, making it an exceptional way of instructing and learning. With STEM, we are teaching skills the way we, we, we use them in the workforce and in the real world. Really does a job require only one skill set, like maths, for example. And I'm going to give you an example because I got this one from, from Principal Copeland, campus Principal Copeland, who is an engineer, in fact. Um, he used science, maths, engineering, technology to develop uh, what is called a percussive harmonic instrument, which is an electronic version of the steel pan. He has eight patents around the world, okay? He has eight patents. Um, so 
the, the, the creative solution not inv only involves science, but engineering, maths, and technology, but also art, because it involves music. <laughs> uh, and if you hear an electronic steel pan, you cannot distinguish it from the, the, the ordinary steel pan, where you're hitting steel, uh, in fact. Um, and also, he told me that um, because he's an engineer, he knows a lot about how to make circuit boards and stuff. But the other aspects of the music and the aesthetics and stuff um, were done by people who were over in humanities, who designed the instrument to look superb. And there's some lessons from that also. For example, companies like um, Apple produce laptops. And some people only buy the Apple laptop, not because it's better, but because it looks better. Or, you know, for example, the aesthetics. And a lot of that comes from on the art side. That is not just the science and the engineering. OK? Um, there are other aspects of the skills that you need to introduce. So um, the, these, these, uh, the, what, what has been learned is that you know, the subjects don't work on their own. Instead, they, they're woven together in a practical and seamless way, allowing the electronic engineer to design an instrument that sounds and looks good. In fact, that, that's, that's what, uh, you know, the conversation that I had with him. Um, and out of that, um, a company has been formed. Okay, there, there is a company uh, that has, has been formed um, and grants given and so on. So I'm just saying, it's not just about the this, this science and the engineering and, and, and so forth. There are other aspects as well. So art matters are very, very importantly. And we think that um, no one should be able to go through um, schooling without doing some aspects of art. And we are a little bit bothered by the fact that they make you sign up for engineering or science and you make it very difficult for you to do other courses. Um, that you should be able to allow, allow to do a number of other courses in other areas like arts and humanities and so forth. So, so art matters um, and art is often neglected and undervalued, very distressful. Um, we have the stereotype of the starving artist that is sadly pursuing arts as a profession is often a, a, a financial struggle. Um, and it, uh, you, children are told that it's difficult um, to, in many societies, they make a living solely as an artist. So, so parents tell their children, oh, you know, go and do medicine or law or engineering because you'll make more money off of that. Um, keep away from arts. You're not going to make any money. That's the message that is transmitted. Um, so often, or artists are often asked to cut their rates or simply to turn out for work for exposure. Um, if there's a perceived lack of value in their art. And all of this is completely wrong that we, and that we need to change. Um, in fact, incorporating the arts could bring many other students to the table that otherwise have, would have uh, lost interest. So let me just remind you, um, between, between, uh, because um, the Dean Cato uh, 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 alluded to this already. When, 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 you, when you look at some of the most famous scientists on the planet, let me just refer to Albert Einstein. Einstein gave us the theory of general rel relativity, unified field theory, field, field theory, and perhaps the most famous equation, E equal mc squared. Everybody knows that, which represents the equivalence of mass um, uh, and energy. Einstein famously stated, the, this is a quote from Einstein, the greatest scientists are artists as well. This is what Einstein said. Einstein himself played violin and piano. Most people don't know that, okay? Um, Benjamin Franklin, let me just mention another famous scientist. Um, amazing uh, contribution to, to, to science. Um, and he was an inventor, a painter, and a sculptor. And his notebooks are filled with beautiful sketches that are important. Um, as the text and the formulas, um, you know. So I'm just saying, uh, and yes, I'll best mention Leonardo da Vinci, who was uh, amazing, a genius, and who painted, you see all of his statues around, and who was a scientist as well, uh, and a father of architecture. So 
it's not that it should be one or the other. We have to find some way of integrating all of these together. So STEM and STEAM are not new. They're simply ways of understanding, understanding and applying an integrated form of learning that resembles real life. Um, instead of teaching maths as separate from science, they can be taught together in a way that shows how the knowledge from these two fields complement and support each other. Um, so, so it's very critical to add the A uh, into the, the, the STEAM uh, approach because the STEAM part and the arts is the way of incorporating creative thinking and applied arts in real situations. Art is just about working, it's not just about working in a studio. Art is about discovering and creating ingenious ways of problem solving, uh, integrating principles or representing information. Um, many, many people feel that adding the A in STEAM is unnecessary and that the application of creativity and arts is a natural part of STEM. And they're probably correct, but others like to highlight it. Um, I've spoken to a number of, of elementary school children, and in particular, they like to include the A to ensure that that facet of learning doesn't get forgotten in our lessons. Um, whether you prefer STEM or STEAM, the underlying principles and practices are very much the same. It's all about integration of the pillars of science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. Um, in my own case, I remember as a child, I used to sing in the music festival, <laughs> okay? Um, you know, so uh, I'm just saying uh, these things are not separated and, and need to be integrated and merged because it's closer to real life. What, one of the skills that you get out of on the arts side is that you have to make judgments not made on hard facts. That is part of the limitation of science where when you do maths, and, and physics and chemistry and, and so forth, they all have hard rules, scientific rules, okay? But real life is not like that. And that is a skill that you get out of the arts. When, when you look, when you listen to music or you look at a painting um, or, or, or you, you know, on, on the humanities or you read something, people see different things and they have to exercise judgment, okay? Um, it's not hard facts like in science. Um, and this is closer to real life of exercising judgment. So, so people have told me, you know, um, when, I, when I look at the painting, um, I feel as though I'm there, I'm seeing different things and I'm sensing various things. Um, and that is closer to real life of, of uh, actual decision-making. So I, I would emphasize that STEM, you know, um, reflects real life. Of, of making decisions based on imprecise information, uh, in fact, and it's critical that that be introduced. So when you go into the workforce, of course, jobs in the, world, in the real world are interdisciplinary. Um, we need to educate children in, in how subjects integrate and work together. They need to develop diverse skills sets and a passion for exploration and growth. Um, we don't need children to memorize random facts anymore. We have so many facts at our fingertips now. Um, when I'm having a debate with someone, I can pull out my phone and in seconds have all the facts, okay? Education is no longer about memorizing facts. Instead, it's about learning how to work and how to think critically and evaluate information. And the evaluate information is a quite critical aspect that comes from the art side how to apply knowledge, research, and skills um, to problem solve. Those skills need to be taught in an applied way. Um, that's what all the, the young people have, have um, told me, that they prefer to be taught in an applied way. Give me a case study, okay? Show me things and so forth. Don't just to show me, teach me theoretically. Uh, uh, it doesn't have any uh, credibility. So, so, as uh, some way, um, we have to change the educational system in Trinidad and Tobago because uh, a lot of the educational system is based in teaching in silos, separate subjects, doing only what's on the curriculum, uh, in fact, and not integrating them uh, a floor. So STEM embraces um, what I would call the four C's um, identified, 
um, as critical in the 21st century, which is creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, and communication. So let me repeat them. Um, the four C's, crit creativity, collaboration. When you're working, you're not working alone, you know, you have to collaborate with other person. And that is a skill that you have to you also develop and learn how to work with others and share ideas and stuff and critical thinking, okay? And communication, uh, in, in fact, that's the modern world that we're in. And most importantly, by incorporating inquiry-based principles and a highly adaptable framework to suit students of various needs. STEM helps to foster a love of learning. That's the critical thing, love of learning. And the most important gift uh, an education should give a student is a love of learning, uh, in fact. Um, so um, I hope I have made you know, some traction and, and have, you know, because I'm very passionate about this, that I don't even want the science students to only learn science. I think they have to learn those other skills that come out of the arts. Um, and I'm really put off by the fact that, um, you know, UE should be in every degree that they're doing. They should allow students mandatorily to do some other artistic um, courses as well. You, you should not, if you're an engineering student, only do engineering. You should not, if you're a science student, only do physics, maths, chemistry, biology, and stuff like that, okay? Because you're going to uh, miss some certain critical uh, thinking skills. Um, okay, so you, 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 uh, I think you, you, you get my point um, and I will, um, I will end it there. I think I'm out of time, <laughs> okay? But I'm very passionate in pursuing this and um, we look forward to having other partners as we pursue trying to change the educational system in Trinidad and Tobago um, along the STEM and STEAM line and introduce the arts as well and to integrate everything together um, and advance the, the, the thinking. So let me just end by saying something I've said before. I had given a lecture years ago. It was my professorial inaugural lecture. And I said, when I, when I evaluate, um, you know, various academic subjects, and I put them on a scale of one to 10. And I will start off with the ones that I think are the easiest. I would put a number, the easiest would be number one. The easiest subject is maths. And other people were astounded. I said, maths has hard rules. It's easy to learn. Once you figure that out, you, you, you'll be brilliant at maths, okay? And the next in line, number two, would be physics. It's easy. And people thought, but those are the hardest things. And, and, and you know, chemistry, because they, all of them have rules, okay? Uh, when you get into biology and stuff, life seems to have been designed to defeat rules. So the biology doesn't conform to all of the rules. And the people who, who are the, do the, the biggest thinking and stuff and the most creative, I said, are in the arts. Those, those are the persons who are the smartest. When you read a book and you read the book, people get into the atmosphere, depending on how well you write it and stuff and feel that they're there and present. When you, when you look at, at, at a painting or you hear music, people hear different things, in fact. And that would seem to me to be the brilliant approach. Not, not the science part. The science part for me is easy, <laughs> uh, in fact. So I will end on that note. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Egard. Your passion was evident. Yes. And what resonates is that real life, in order to navigate real life, we need interdisciplinary and integrated approaches. And that the philosophy behind our understanding of STEM and STEAM is really critical in taking us forward. So this integrated and interdisciplinary approach will pro which promotes the best from um, both sides is critical to moving us forward 
forward in developing the greatest potential from everyone. Um, for, to harness that creativity, um, that uh, critical thinking, that artistic expression, design thinking, and apply it to problem solving um, will definitely benefit everyone. Um, well thanks said. again. Thank, Thank you much. so much for your presentation. So um, moving right on, um, we're going to look a little bit in more detail at what is STEM education, because we've been seeing a lot about it this afternoon about STEM and STEAM. And so these are variants. So, so we have with us Dr. Nazir. Dr. Joanne Nazir is a lecturer at the School of Education, St. Augustine campus. She holds degrees in science and education from the UWI and a doctorate in curriculum studies and teacher development from the University of Toronto. She has worked at the secondary and tertiary levels in diverse educational institutions in the Caribbean and Canada. She specializes in facilitating courses in teacher education, particularly in the teaching of science. Her research interests are related to the areas of science education, environmental education, and teacher education. Joanne presents and publishes in these areas at international conferences and in peer-reviewed journals. So Dr. Nazir is going to address us on what is STEM education and its different variants. Dr. Nazir? Hi, Nalini. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot for for what your, you know, I think I shared the wrong thing. Um, so I'm just going to start um, trying to share this, um, the PowerPoint that I have. Uh, a lot of the um, people who have spoken before, I'm a bit bored and cold at because they have spoken with great, um, with great passion about um, about what they think on the same team, what they think um, STEM education is, and uh, they have spoken about the variants as well. So there will be some overlap in what I will be speaking about, but um, I think um, I'm speaking from the perspective of an educator um, in science and environmental education, um, so that I can speak to some of the things that have been in types of educational thinking that have been going going on and we will see that it overlaps with what goes with all three speakers, what they have said before, um, particularly uh, Professor Agard with respect to the interdisciplinary, um, the need for the, the inter interdisciplinary connection between the various uh, STEM disciplines, as well as with Professor Kato um, in terms of uh, adding the arts in with creativity. So, um, so to get started, so simply put, STEM education, as many have said before, is the teaching and learning in, field, in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. It typically includes educational activities across all grade levels, from preschool to postdoctorate in both formal, for example, classrooms, and informal settings, for example, after school um, programs. Uh, STEM education is a movement that has steadily gained traction worldwide over the past two decades. It has grown out of two ideas that have become widely accepted since the turn of the century. The first of these has to do with links between societal health and well-being and STEM endeavors and outcomes. We only have to look at the world today to see how heavily our lives are intertwined with technological and engineering artifacts. These artifacts have physical, health, mental, and moral implications that greatly determine our decisions and how our lives are lived. STEM endeavors have also been linked to the development of new skills, for example, collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking and creative thinking, the so-called 21st century skills that, that the other speakers have referred to as well. Links have also been made between prosperity and knowledge intensive jobs dependent on science and technology. The latter has led in turn to increasing concerns about the decreasing numbers of students staying in and graduating from STEM education at the tertiary level. And this is also known as the leaky STEM pipeline. So the leaky, leaky STEM pipeline may be discussed later by other speakers, but it is important for us to understand at this, at something about it at this time because it's 
really one of the hallmarks or trade marks of what distinguishes STEM from other STEM similar endeavors. The graphic on the slide illustrates this concept. It shows that all of all high school graduates, only about 4% ever obtain a STEM degree or initial tertiary qualification. Put another way, there is a, a 96% leakage from the system. And while this is, this is US data, this is a US diagram, it is the opinion of many local persons that these findings hold, hold true for Trinidad and Tobago as well. Now, STEM education started off um, as a relatively simple endeavor to integrate engineering and technology into the structure of science and math education. By giving core ideas of engineering and technology, the same status as those, um, those previously mentioned, discipline, science and math. In fact, the acronym first used was SMET, emphasizing that the endeavor started with science and math educators. But, um, but early on, but, but early on, supporters thought SMET SMET sounded a bit too much like SMUT. So they coined the phrase STEM, which has which has more which which is more aesthetically pleasing and did much to push the movement forward. Over time, STEM education has grown in complexity. So today's STEM endeavors, um, different programs are, are, have developed in different places from different uh, that focus on different things. Today's STEM programs are associated as uh, Professor Egard and um, Dean Cato have have have, have um, suggested they are associated with multidisciplinarity, curriculum integration, higher order thinking skills, systems thinking, real world applications, solving authentic contextually relevant problems, social justice and equity, and educational leadership. There are many de definitions of STEM, but a definition that comes that has been developed by us at the School of Education that we are working with currently is, is, is as follows, a program that will emphasize innovation, deep learning, and the development of science identities, utilizing a coherent, integrated, and multidisciplinary approach, focused on building conceptual and higher order thinking skill, skills through real world applications to complex situations and solving authentic, contextually relevant problems. Now that's a, a bit of a mouthful, but I think it, um, it, 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 it the whole the whole idea of STEM is it has become so, so complex when people think about it that we need that kind of chunky um, deep uh, deep type of definition to capture what we really really want with STEM. So um, the STEM concept continues to grow in complexity and it has spawned a number of variants as others have caught on to its spirit. For example, you have as people have have, have mentioned STEAM where the A stands for the arts. You have STEM, S-T-E-M-M, -M, where the extra M stands for medicine. We also have STREAM. Um, the R stands for different things in different places. Some people, the, uh, the most common ones are reading and religion. But here in Trinidad, we have um, interpreted, the Ministry of Education has interpreted R as research. Um, Advocates of these variations point out that their interpretations provide opportunity for re refocusing upon imagination, creativity, and innovation in and innovation in design thinking. But there are critics of these th these types of um, variants as well. Critics point out that these variation variations may be muddying the waters, adding aspects that take away from the core purpose of STEM, which is to get more graduates in science, math, engineering, and technology. Their concerns can be summed up as, are we harming the baby by putting too much into the bathwater? Or are these variations a case of shallow metuism? Now, uh, I think this is something that we need to, to really, really, it's a, it's a valid point and we really, really have to think about it carefully as we move forward with our own endeavors. Um, so in, in Trinidad and Tobago, in closing, what I would like to say is that efforts in STEM, for STEM education in Trinidad and Tobago have been persistent. Examples include science being compulsory up to Form 3, math being um, up to Form 5 in formal education. There's a Shell STEM initiative, there's Car Caribbean self, 
science foundation training courses for teachers, Digicel and Cisco Girls Power Tech Challenge. There are a number of school STEM clubs that have developed. But despite all these efforts, there is concern about the coherence and effectiveness of these efforts and a general call that we need more STEM education. So that's what I have for us today. Nalini, I hope I have added to the discussion um, and um, helped um, bridge some of those ideas that the previous speakers have, um, have spoken about and what, will, what is still to come in the second half of this seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nazir. You have certainly added to our understanding of what STEM um, represents, uh, its conceptualization, and how that understanding can help to take us forward. And um, you've brought to our attention these different variants. So today we've been focusing a lot on STEAM. And um, we would like to see how um, STEAM in particular um, helps position, position us for um, future endeavors in this field. Now, um, the STEM pipeline is really critical for us to, um, to examine and to see where we are um, losing our um, STEM potentials. So um, unfortunately, we are not able to have our next advertised presentation by Ms. Stacy Patel Kisun, who is Shell's HR manager, and she was going to elaborate a little bit more on that STEM pipeline and economic competitiveness. But we still have much on our table, so we will move into um, a presentation by Dr. Suzanne Burke. Dr. Burke is a lecturer in cultural studies attached to the Department of Literary Communication and Cultural Studies, UWI St. Augustine. Her research focuses on Caribbean culture, festivals, cultural industries, and creative entrepreneurship, as these relate to the development and evaluation of cultural policies and programs. She has been involved with the creative entrepreneurship and design master's program since master of arts program since its inception in 2011. Dr. Burke is going to focus on her presentation on a new role for the arts in the UEI STEAM, creativity, imagination, and innovation through design thinking. Dr. Burke. Thank you very much, Nalini. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, so good evening, everyone. I think it's just about or close to evening. Um, I am very happy to be here this evening and to talk about something that is very, very um, dear to my heart, which is um, STEAM and arts and culture. So I wanted to start with, um, let me just get rid of something here. I wanted to start with um, some definitions and I know people have, kind of defined these before, but I wanted to say that there are so many, there's no real consensus in terms of these uh, definitions. And I wanted to make sure that these signposts are clear um, to us. So STEAM, of course, is the inclusion of arts and arts practices in the teaching learning process. STEAM seeks to blur the lines between these disciplinary areas. But I must stress that it is simply not a question of adding, you know, arts into um, the, the, the STEAM, the, the STEM um, program. So the STEAM program involves, of course, the arts education and arts integration and STEM. Uh, but the goals of these things may be different from what STEAM is trying to do. So that STEAM is not only about using arts to teach another subject. So using drawing to teach architecture or using music to teach 
um, computation and so on. Yeah, so it goes a little beyond that. In that sense, STEAM is an approach to teaching and learning um, in which students demonstrate and learn, as we said, critical thinking, um, creative problem solving, and cultural confidence. So in that sense, we know that STEAM um, learning occurs at the intersection of arts education, arts integration, and STEM. And what we are trying to do, as I keep saying, is treading the needle between um, these three institutional practices. So I also wanted to take some time to talk about what is design thinking and why is it important to what we are discussing today. And I use a um, definition that was developed by um, Tom and David Kelly, who are the people who designed um, Apple's, many of Apple's products and so on. And they describe design thinking as ways of understanding human needs and creating new solutions by bringing appropriate tools and mindsets to the design practice. And so in that sense, it is a method which can um, address a wide range of economic, environmental, and business um, challenges that we have every day. The importance of design thinking in this entire scenario is that it can act as the bridge or the linchpin that helps us develop ways of making STEAM and STEM walk and talk in the classroom. I mean, theoretically, we know um, the importance of STEM and STEAM and the integration and so on, but I think that many practitioners may have some challenges in terms of how they actualize these practices in the classroom. And we are saying that design thinking is one of the ways in which we can employ to ensure that that um, actually gets taught. So design thinking promotes what we call a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset that facilitates divergent and convergent thinking. So Professor Agard was talking about science having rules, so it's very convergent, right? Um, through the exploration of factors in the real world. And some of these factors include tech technical factors, so we look at whether something is feasible. Human factors, we look at if something is desirable. Business factors, we look at if something is viable. And environmental factors, and of course, this is of course of much importance to us in the Caribbean, we're actually looking at sustainability. So design thinking sits in the middle of these four factors. And we say that what we are trying to do with design thinking is find that sweet spot. You see that star in the middle um, in the, uh, the, the figure on your right hand side. That's what we're really trying to do with design thinking, that we're trying to find that viability and that sweet spot in what we do. So in terms of the um, in terms of the benefits to teaching and learning, there are many. Now for teachers, it provides a creative space for teachers um, to utilize or to explore different learning areas. And one of the things um, I came across in some of my reading was that in Singapore, teachers are allowed what they call a 10% white space that allows them to use whatever creative um, methods they have at their disposal to teach the curriculum. So it's not only what is on the curriculum or the, only the methods that are um, identified in the curriculum that they can use. And STEAM and STEM thinking allows for that kind of white space or creative space that we are talking about. But it also promotes connectivity in developing um, that integrative curricula. It allows you to tread that needle. In terms of the students, it helps with their observational skills. It helps them, of course, define and solve problems. And more importantly, it helps them to transform and synthesize learning through adapting, making mistakes, failing, failing well, failing big, and coming again. So it's the combination of these disparate areas. And as been said by many speakers before, the beautiful thing about this is that it is based on experience. So on your right, you see another figure that was developed by the Kelly brothers that gives a kind of framework for design thinking. And you see that there are four aspects or four phases, um, inspiration, synthesis, um, ideation and implementation. And really it is an iterative process. And they start with inspiration because learning 
well ought to start with being inspired or being curious. And of course, then you synthesize, you ideate, you experiment, and then of course you implement. And it's that iterative process of arts into STEM and STEM into arts, as I said earlier. So it's not just an adding on of something, but really an integration. So I wanted to now spend the rest of the time given to me to, to actually talk or show two examples of how um, steaming can be applied in the classroom using design thinking. These two examples are different. One is at, looks at secondary school students learning math um, and computing. And the other one, of course, has to do with design and entrepreneurship and innovation. So, um, so this notion, this notion of culturally situated design tools was developed by someone called Ron Eklash. And for those of you who are interested in TED, he gave a very interesting TED talk that has how many million um, viewers. But his main area of research is looking at fractals in everyday life. Um, and fractals, of course, geo geometric shapes that are ongoing. Right? And so he uses um, these culturally situated design tools to teach, especially in underserved areas. So the example that I want to share this evening is one called Corner Curves. So Corner Curves is a CSDT program that was developed to teach math and computing skills. Corners, as we all know, have a repertoire of non-linear patterns, often resulted in a complex array of logarithmic curves. So if you look at the um, picture there, you see various kind of iterations of corners. And here you see a student who was actually developed um, using computing skills, um, designs of corners. And he says, I named this Tissiat. I, it shows strength and holding people to get, together. The math is based on rotation, yeah? So in terms of corner curves, students are taught by using braiding techniques. So you see there the braid. Um, and of course, all of us know that when we're braiding, the braid starts off fat and then it gets thinner and the braid can curve in different ways and so on. And this is one of the ways in which they are taught math. So this student, and they actually ask questions in terms of the Y shape. So here you see an example. If the first is one inch wide, how wide is the second, et cetera. And this student says, I've been braiding my whole life, but now I realize I was doing math. The design tool enabled what we call design agency among students. So they were very, very clear that they could now sit at a computer and design. So math and computing were no longer seen as barriers to their learning, to their creativity, to their confidence, but rather as a bridge, right, to help them solve their creativity. So here again, you see an example of um, the computing. And this student says, I now know that whatever career I choose, it has to deal with computers. So after the program, after the teaching, um, they were actually empowered um, to, to choose math and computing as a career, yeah? So in terms of this Conroe um, program, we see that students benefited in many ways, Conroe curves. They learned through discovery. And I want to say that they learned something new about something with which they were already familiar. And that's the best way to learn, learning through discovery. They also acquired art and design skills. They learned math and computing. They also learned about their culture, right? So they learned the history of cornrows and so on. And that was a very important part. So this student says, your lessons have inspired me to further my knowledge and understanding about my culture and where I come from. Yeah. And Dean Cato talked about the importance of confidence. Well, they gain confidence in STEM areas, which we say um, are now acting as a bridge to their own creativity. And they, they then looked at fractals in nature and in architecture and created designs um, based on those things. So design agency was one of the ways in which they were able um, to show um, what they've learned in art, in science, in computing, in history, 
um, and in cultural studies. So this student says, I'm interested in civil engineering, but I also enjoy studying different cultures, art and their history. I was happy to know there is a way to combine the two. So that's one example of using STEAM, art, science, math in a very integrative way. It's not added on, it's embedded in the way, in the methods of teaching. The second example I'm using is a lot closer to home, of course. It is the MA in Creative Design and Entrepreneurship. And we know that this was developed in 2011. So we are now 10 years in the game um, and it is seated in the Department of Festival and Creative Arts. It hones critical skills, all the skills that we say that we need today to survive. And of course, it is an excellent example of STEAM using design. So it centralizes design in the discourse of art, entrepreneurship, management, and innovation. And it brings together in one classroom, artists, engineers, social scientists, various disciplines to work creatively together in a stimulating type of environment. So students are encouraged to work both as individuals and in groups. And for those of us who are teachers, we know the trepidation with which sometimes we even as teachers give out group work because of what sometimes happens. But what we found in this program is that the diversity of backgrounds and discipline actually makes the group work very dynamic. And um, it causes what we call divergent thinking so that um, students um, contribute um, to all the, from their various backgrounds and stuff. And that ultimately leads to a deeper learning and teaching experience. And of course, better designs and processes. So this student from this year's cohort says, as a creative strategist, I immediately gained value in my first course, the nature of creativity. I learned to really trust the process and obtained an alternative view of inter the interconnectedness between creativity and business. The insights I gleaned from just the first semester alone completely transformed the way I approach my marketing and has certainly influenced the design of my business model. And I just wanted to share very quickly three um, projects th that are indicative of the way in which we do projects at CDEN that are embedded in real world experiences and thread the needle in terms of an integrative way of using design um, and STEAM in the classroom. So for instance, the students were tasked with doing a feasibility design study of the teddy bear cottage. So this is a business that is situated in Santa Rosa Heights and the proprietor um, bought a house in Santa Rosa and filled it with teddy bears. So it was a novelty thing. Children would come and there are hundreds and hundreds of teddy bears in this house. It's quite amazing actually. Um, but the students were able to help the proprietor repurpose um, the, 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 um, the business to not only be a novelty thing where you go and you kind of look at teddy bears and you hug them and so on, but they were able to encourage her to use the space as a space for counseling children who were abused, um, for people to expand the business, um, to, to create, she bought uh, another house that is next to the cottage and it's now an event um, planning um, facility and so on. So that through um, CDEN, we were able to um, encourage the proprietor to expand her business and repurpose her business. So that's just one example. And of course, we're using design, architecture, landscaping, graphics, and, um, and art. Another example, of course, is the way in which we look at everyday artifacts in families and in communities. And one of the um, projects that we did with our students was this um, curating of these everyday um, tools and products into museums at the community level. And this project helped students um, develop um, curating skills, design skills, um, community engagement, 
family engagement, communication, all of those kinds of things. And the last one I would share with you is um, the spatial kind of redesign of a panyard in the UE community. This is Curep Chizando, which is one of the biggest panyards in Trinidad and Tobago. And the project was based on getting um, the uh, community um, around the area and the um, band to repurpose spatially how they used um, the, the, the floor space that at their disposal, but also some of the businesses that were in um, the panyard. So for instance, they did the manufacture steel pans and so on. And the students were able to identify some of the chemicals that they were using that were not safe and so on. So again, the integration of science, chemistry, math, community engagement, culture, and the arts. So in closing, I want to say that STEAM, or what I would like to say, design-led STEAM affords students opportunities to develop emotional intelligence, engaging in active self-learning and sort of taking responsibility for their learning, yeah? So in that case, it's really the teacher is the facilitator um, in the best tradition of the philosophy of education that, that talks about, um, you know, humanism, right? So you're facilitating and guiding. They then take responsibility for their learning. Um, it improves their motivation, their perseverance, their engagement, and of course, they develop self-efficacy and emotional um, regulation. In terms of cognitive development, and I think this is perhaps which, where um, STEAM or design-led STEAM education is most important. It's ways of seeing and ways of knowing yourself. And if it's well done, design-led STEAM education helps in terms of cultural self-knowing, relational self-knowing, critical knowing, and visionary and ethical knowing. So I want to say that when STEAM, when paired with design-led thinking in the teaching learning process builds the creative confidence, which is inherently an optimistic way at looking at what is possible. And of course, the times that we are living in now um, means that we need that basket of skills. We need to reimagine how we want to be and how we want to live. And Lloyd Best used to say, we only have to see um, to, to make mass with the possibilities. We only need to fashion uh, a new way of being if we see what is right there in front of us. So I want to end there and I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke. I really believe that you hit the sweet spot uh, by exemplifying for us how design thinking is not a surface integration, but a, a purposeful, focused, committed use of um, a, a way of approaching um, the teaching and the integration to bring out uh, all the desired elements. Uh, and uh, um, it's maybe um, difficult uh, for us to conceptualize because we still have teaching in silos, as was mentioned, mm -hmm. I believe, by Professor Agard and yourself. So we have to be able to bridge how we will not only integrate the science and the technology, the, um, the engineering and the mathematics, but also the arts. And not just, as you mentioned, for the purpose of drawing your design, but for really um, you know, internalizing um, all the skills uh, that can be developed uh, and nurtured by this integration of the arts. Thank you, Dr. Burke. You're welcome. So at, at this point in time, we have some time for a few questions. We'd like to thank all our panelists who have presented so far, Professor Ramnarine, Professor Agard, um, Dr. Keto, Dr. Nazir, and Dr. Burke. So we have a few questions from the um, viewing audience. Uh, just a gentle reminder to the audience, when you're posting your questions, try to make sure that you have set your post to everyone. Um, or to panelists and attendees so that everyone can benefit from um, the comments and questions that you have um, posted, right? So um, Dr. Cato, maybe we'll begin with you. 
um, one of our attendees is interested in how do we re-examine and restory our histories? Because you mentioned in your presentation, looking back in order to look forward. So how do we re-examine and restory our histories? Well, um, there, there is no simple answer to that. I, I, I would say a lot of work has been done in that area. I would say since about the, the um, 60s, we, we have gone through a period that, that, that we refer to as, as the creolization of our history, which means writing our history from our perspective with no apologies. Um, we still have a long way to go. We still have more things to do, but I think there's a lot more out there that people realize. What scares me though is, 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 is that I don't think this retelling, um, I, 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 I don't think the general public is a much a, very much aware of it. I think a lot of it is staying in textbooks on shelves. Yeah. So 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 I think the task really is that how do we share? Yeah, what stories we have we told and, and 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 that worries me because sometimes even when we teach on on, on on the campus and i look at some of the questions that are set um that there 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 there's not a parallel so sometimes i really wonder what are we teaching this for why are we exposing our students to this for because it's not going back to, to, to the schools and it's not reflected in the examinations um so so i we feel let me make the point i really want to make is that a lot has been retold the, the problem is that we have not disseminated it and, and we, we have to find a way to do that and and but I, but i don't want from to chill, chill from the history of retelling because i think it has to be done we have to get our students doing history again in schools to understand what it is because that is the process of how we're going to retell the, the, the history or we can do the research with the necessary rigor needed and and because i keep saying we are young nations we are still finding our way so yes there's a lot more that, that, um, that we have to to, to to do i hope too that we can also do more um in terms of public history because i i think that will also help to bridge the gap between um the academic walls and the general public and getting the 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 history out there and getting more people involved in the retelling thank you thank you so much dr keto um, I think I will pose this question to Professor Egard and ask also that Dr. Burke may chime in. Um, Professor Egard, you talked about the perception of persons re in regarding the arts, and one of our attendees would like to know what can be done to change the mindset of persons regarding the arts. And if Professor is not available, Dr. Burke, would you be able to assist? Can you repeat the question? Certainly. What can be done? Mm -hmm. To change the mindset of persons regarding the arts. <laughs> That's an age-old question um, for which um, I don't know that I have the right answer, but I think that the more and more um, we integrate arts um, into teaching, um, this notion of creative confidence is really important. Um, and I think the Cornwall example um, kind of showed that as well, that um, what we do and who we are is good enough, it's viable, it's important, it is um, what we can actually use to kind of, as, as Tony Hall used to say, being Caribbean in the world. But we have to continue to do because there um, is so much that we, um, we, we kind of shy away from and we apologize for and so on. So I think it is important, um, we at the university have a particular responsibilities, particularly in the humanities, um, for um, showing the importance of art and humanities to civilization. What we're seeing being acted out now um, in the global sphere, again, um, simple things like caring for each other, 
you know, um, for truth, um, for community development and community spirit, Gayap, Len Hand, all of those things are part of ways of life and ways of being. We take it for granted, but I think that if we shine a light on it and we, we explicate it more, I think Dean Cato said they remain in books um, and there, are, there has to be ways in which that we um, democratize that knowledge in that sense. Now the knowledge is there, it's implicit, it's, it's there, it's tacit, but we have to make that tacit knowledge explicit. This is who we are, this is what we do, this is how we survive, this is what is good. Um, and we have to find the avenues to do that for us to appreciate the importance of art to life. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke. And that really aligns well with what Dean Keto said, that mm -hmm. it's not that the evidence is not there, but it is not disseminated. And so we really actively have to shine a light and bring it mm -hmm. forward. And Professor Agard highlighted so many um, that uh, things that we may not have known about, um, you know, persons who uh, we uh, are prominent in society. Mm -hmm and how much of the arts they embodied, but which is may have not been publicized. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Burke. I'll ask Dr. Nazir to lead off on this one. And if anybody else from the panel, um, the presenters who went before would like to chime in, you can also do so. Dr. Nazir, um, an attendee would like to know what is the best way to get involved in STEM education for her for her child who is a secondary school student. What is the best way to get involved? How do you stimulate that kind of interest? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question, Nalini. And um, uh, I would say that um, they have to get involved, um, involved in in science and math and in the arts in, in, in any STEM program. We know that there are STEM endeavors and STEM clubs um, uh, that, that have been started throughout in, in, in communities by, by um, companies like, like Shell, um, by Nihurst. There are, there are a number of, of, of initiatives out there. And um, to get in, you have to find the right fit for your child, of course, as in any kind of educational endeavor, but to simply just get involved. Um, in something. Uh, Dr. talked a lot about uh, initiatives that are done at the community level. Look in your own community. I would suggest that you look in your own community, see what's available there. Look, look to the school, see what's available there. Um, they're, they're, and, 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 um, and just, take, yeah, just get your child in some way involved. Uh, but it, I think it's important to have like an authentic type of STEM endeavor. Um, like some of the ones um, Dr. Burke spoke about, perhaps some of the things um, Professor Egar spoke about as well, um, so that you're not repeating for the child the experience that they might have where they think these things are boring or, um, or um, not relevant to them. So if, if your child doesn't think um, what they're doing, say at school, they may perhaps their school experience is not what um, interests them, and um, but you know that they have a, a talent for this for, 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 for STEM, uh, get them involved in something else. Perhaps uh, others can chime in on this as well. Thanks, Dr. Nazir. If any other panelists want to um, to add, please uh, turn on your camera. Um, so it requires actively making decisions about uh, what the exposure that students have uh, in school, after school, outside of school, what you get them involved in. And I will share a personal experience. Uh, um, so we don't only want to expose them um, to um, STEM, but also to the arts and the humanities as we've been hearing a lot about um, uh, how much benefits we can um, accrue from that. Um, there can be some subtle encouragement as well in terms of uh, the opportunities that you provide for your own students, for your children, right? As parents, um, even as educators, you know, what you expose them to in clubs or what activities you buy for them, chemistry sets, craft sets, et cetera. These, these things can also start to engender that kind of interest. And if you see that they are interested and they want to know more, then, you know, 
know you can help them um, find the avenues to learn more. Thanks, Dr. Nazir. Um, now, um, one of the questions um, I'd like to pose, I am not directing it to anyone in particular, um, but maybe um, both, well, actually almost anyone can chime in on this one. Um, how would interdisciplinary teaching and learning be implemented in our secondary schools? So, so we talked about being interdisciplinary and being integrated. Dr. Burke, I don't know if you would like to lead off on that. How can interdisciplinary teaching and learning be implemented in our secondary schools? Thank you. Um, I think that the, the first thing is the will has to have it. Yeah, so there must be some sort of buy-in that there is some kind of benefit in um, an integrated approach, number one, because you're talking to uh, school administrators who may not necessarily um, agree that um, integration might work. So that's the first thing. But I think that um, there are models that show people actually um, bringing certain, um, threading that needle. So um, using certain um, models inside of the classroom to teach different things. So that even if you're learning a language, there's a way in which the language could be taught that may um, look at geography, may look at culture, um, so that you're, you're integrating. Now it takes a lot more planning, I have to say. Um, it means that you're pulling from the different strands, but it takes that kind of cross-dimensional planning between the different teachers in the subject areas so that not only are you integrating in your area, but there's continuity. So what I teach in my area resonates with what you are teaching in your area. So it really calls for the kind of um, kind of 360 degree approach um, to, to um, planning curricula and lesson plans and so on. So you actually have to do those things, um, you know, in collaboration with each other. So it is, it is almost reculturing the way that curricula are developed and implemented. Um, first starting off with the will. And then there are numerous examples of ways in which um, you can use um, science and teaching art or art and teaching science and so on. I mean, all of the examples are there, but to me, the barrier is the will and the structures and the policies in terms of, of you know, the school day and how that happens. But I think what COVID allows us is opportunities to change things that we thought we could not change in terms of um, periods, times, um, subject areas, and so on, that allows for that kind of collaboration and cooperation to take place. Thank you so much. Dr. Nazir, you wanted to add? I think Del Professor Delisle had his hand up. Okay, and your mic is off, Dr. Nazir. Okay. So um, building on what Dr. Berg said, we know our, our curriculum um, as it stands is it's pretty siloed and it's geared towards um, an exam orientation. So at a big level, our curriculum has to change our, our, the way we think about educational philosophy and, and um, the way our school system is structured. But that's a really, really huge task and others have spoken about that in other seminars like this, in, in, in other webinars like this. But building on what Dr. Burke said, at the school level, teachers can take whatever curriculum that they have, and um, it depends, and, and work together to form these integrated these spaces for integrated projects, for integrated curricula. It does take a lot of time, it does take a lot of planning, but starting, say, like with a real world problem, maybe once a term, once a year with your class, and working with others, to, um, to develop a, a, some, some a type of project that, that, that integrates all of the um, that integrates all of the areas together in a real way to solve some kind of problem um, or, or issue that's relevant to students could perhaps be a way for teachers to work on this um, and to bring students in together. It, 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 it does require quite a lot of work, I would say. 
um, but it does, it, there are opportunities there. Um, one of the things that uh, Dr. Will spoke about was the white space, that white space in, in Singapore schools. And if that could be built into our timetable for, um, for teachers to find that time, because one of the things teachers always speak about is a lack of time, lack of time to do anything. Um, but we have to we have to actually build those those opportunities in, um, and schools can do this if 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 the will is there, if um, teachers and administrators work together to find ways to do it. Um, but the work has to start. It has to start somewhere. Right. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Zero. Professor Dalal, did you want to weigh in at this point? Yeah, because I know that we're late. Very very quick. Both problem based learning and project-based learning are integrative ways of teaching and learning. Our medical school at the start, that's a problem-based learning school. They take a case and they say, bring all of the sciences together. It's a real world situation. So we have been using integration, but it must now be made explicit, both in the curriculum and uh, in the way that we teach. Finally, I need to say that the new PCR in the primary school implemented in 2013 is integrated. So we have begun, but the whole community must be coming forward. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, so we unfortunately have to um, close off on our question and answer se segment for now, um, but we will have another one at the end. We have a few more stimulating presentations for you. So right now we're going to move into a presentation by Dr. Herbert. Dr. Herbert is a senior lecturer, science education at the School of Education, UWI St. Augustine, and she taught general science and chemistry at the secondary level. Dr. Herbert is going to address us on how is STEM different to traditional science in the Caribbean? Dr. Herbert. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nalini. Okay, let me just share. Okay, so thank you again. How is STEM different from traditional science education in the Caribbean? And I'm going to be looking at this um, from the ECCE level, the primary secondary level, not at the tertiary level. And I'm looking at this through actually a, a lens of curriculum design, if you will, by reviewing some of the documentation which will underpin the curriculum experiences provided at these levels. Now, these are some documents, some books that students will experience when they are in the ECCE primary school, for example. And we see it speaks about science. So I'm starting with the science education and then comparing it with STEM. We've been speaking quite a bit about STEM as we started. And science as defined in curriculum documents is a distinct form of creative human activity. It's both a way of finding out about the world and a growing body of ideas. So the science is a discipline that has its processes and its outcomes, its products. And that is what children will be exposed to in the um, science education programs. Um, if we look here at the primary science curriculum 2003, infants to standard one, what we notice is that there are strands of content related to what we can discern as the sub-disciplines, um, living things, ecosystems, matter and materials, might be chemistry, structure and mechanisms, energy, physics and chemistry ideas and earth and space science. So this term science is a simple term used and all the subdisciplines are present, but as you said, they are present separately, but within one program. So they're exposed to the subdisciplines within a program entitled science. Now this primary science um, curriculum that was developed, um, it was based on a revision of an early um, primary school program, which was developed actually in the 1980s and focused heavily on process skills. 
um, in the review, people thought that there was enough content or conceptual understandings, and therefore the revised syllabus focused both on the process as we define the science and the content and skills such as creative problem solving, critical thinking, working cooperatively in teams and using technology effectively. Now ECCE as well, it's a mix of curriculum design. So for example, people were just asking about interdisciplinarity and so on. And at the preschool, for example, at CUB St. Augustine, they adopt an integrated approach with what Prof just spoke about, a project-based learning approach as the vehicle for learning. So that tends to break down the barriers um, among or between the subject matters. And according to Mrs. Sh Ms. Cheryl Ralph, who's an ECC educator, she said, we've moved away from subject-based learning and focused more on integrated metacognitive and problem-solving skill development. So what we see is that in Trinidad and Tobago, right now, experiences of integration are evident. Similarly, for example, in Jamaica, ECC and primaries in 2000, Davies reports that their teacher training promotes both an integrated or a subject-centered approach. And Brown in, speaks about review and revision of curriculum in Jamaica. In, and she says, since 1993, the tendency was to move towards more integration of, as, as the desired teaching approach for grades one to three. So we see these are the intentions of the documents. And as Prof just mentioned, um, the latest reform at the primary level produced the PCR, which adopts an integrated approach. And it's said to be thematic in which learning from different subjects is skillfully melded into a thematic and learning lesson plan. And what it says is facilitates a smooth transition from ECC to infant. And that's because as I just mentioned at the ECCE level, they tend to use projects. And when they investigate a project, for example, um, selling cucumbers, they go through the whole process, or cucumbers, they go through the whole process of um, the agricultural science start, start of it, um, planting the seed, what happens with the seed, what happens with the plant, pollination, then they go into the whole thing about writing it up, your language arts, they speak to the whole notion of selling, which is your economic, social studies. Right? So at the, project, at the ECC level, they do a lot of project work, which tends to break the barriers among the subjects. And in this primary PCR um, syllabus document, there are opportunities actually to design and build models, which relates to what has been said before with regard to design thinking. And so for example, there is an example in the document for science which speaks to create models of traditional models that use wind design and explore possible modifications to demonstrate creativity in um, developing designs and models. So that's at the primary and ECCE level where we see the tendency towards or the desire for integration to remove those silos. Lower secondary science, it was once termed general science, and, but that term is no longer acceptable since when associated with generalized um, science was memorization and verification exercises. And it was a course of study conceived just to give a taste of the separate sciences, as you say, biology, chemistry, and physics, the young children slow learners, et cetera. So we've moved away from that. And we now use actually integrated science or lower secondary science, where again, we are expecting that there is integration. So people are asking, how can we integrate? Um, but what happens is the concept itself of integration is a concept that is difficult and complex because it depends on your view of integration and it grows slowly. So it's a matter of evolution and thinking about it and being sensitized to the whole notion. So levels of integration, as people mentioned, they might be called transdisciplinary, real world problems or projects to start. Um, interdisciplinary students learn the concepts from two or more disciplines that are tightly combined to deepen their knowledge and skills. And in multidisciplinary, this is where you really need the planning whereby there's a common theme and students address the common theme within their separate subject disciplines. So when we look now at the integrated science table of contents documents, those books and texts that we introduced, what we notice is, is it really integrated or combined? Because it's called, described as integrated science. And hence, I guess the reason why people are asking, how do we, what does integrated science look like? Because to them, there is no integrated science in their experience. And perhaps because what we see are 
the units uh, tend to be still within the subdiscipline. So materials that's more chemistry, nutrition, reproduction, diseases, biology, and electron, electrical and magnetic energy, et cetera. That's more the physics side of it. So we tend to see the more combination of the subdisciplines versus the integration. However, at, and at the lower secondary level, the recently revised integrated um, syllabus in 2014 also speaks to that the curriculum focuses on the elemental concepts of the study of biology, chemistry, and physics. So that seems to imply a separation again. At the upper secondary level, however, we now have the CSEC and CAPE, and here we move into the separate disciplines, biology, chemistry, integrated science, physics at CSEC, and CAPE, biology, chemistry, physics. But what we notice about these syllabus documents, again, is the intention for integration, because in the document, what we see appreciate the interrelationship among chemistry, biology, physics, math, and other subjects, develop an awareness, et cetera. So what we notice is that in the chem and bio, there is a specific statement that speaks to integration. Physics does not reference integration, and nor does the integrated science reference the subdisciplines. However, within the syllabus document, et cetera, you see chemistry, biology, physics, interrelationships are not included as an aim. However, when you look at the document, you see they give you examples of where you can actually make the link between or among subjects, for example, in the physics, the effect of forces, investigate the relationship between extension and force. Again, that is um, the more process skill approach, but they speak to refer to biology, movement, refer to chemistry, refer to mathematics, et cetera. So we get these ideas in the documents themselves, which tell us how we can perhaps um, show that there is some interdisciplinarity. Um, with the integrated science, what we notice is that they tend to speak very carefully towards everyday life situations. So they're not speaking so much towards the concepts of, of the discipline and the aims, but actually more the use of it, the application, the integration of information. And in their approach, what we see is a theme which will allow for what we might consider separate sciences to be dealt with within a theme. So for example, the organism and its environment, we see matter, now that might be thought of as chemistry, but we see reproduction and growth, food and nutrition, transport systems, respiration, air pollution. So we see at least the two, chem and bio, being addressed under this theme. So that might be thought of as interdisciplinarity, and you can see it in these other themes as well. However, what we know is in the biology, chemistry, and physics, they are more disciplinary based. They are themes, living organisms, principles of chemistry, et cetera. So they tend to be um, more related to the discipline. That's the theme of the biochem physics, although they focus on the integration within the document itself. So what we see in summary is that generally we find at the lower levels, ECCE, primary, et cetera, the discipline focus essentially. So the discipline is very important there. Um, and it is retained even in interdisciplinarity. Some say that um, the discipline is the focus and it must be supported. Um, some transdisciplinary experiences can happen with a project approach and that happens at the ECC primary and some interdisciplinarity as well at the um, upper secondary where we see they are asked to apply chemical principles to biology or physics, mathematics to address these issues and sub-disciplines in relation to a theme. So that's what the traditional science education has been about. And where we spoke about levels of integration, real world problems, et cetera, before transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches to integration. It's a very simple framework. There are other models and so of integration. Um, and what we notice as well in assessing the physics paper, we see reference to light, but in relation to the human. In the biology, we see reference to the eye, but in relation to the lens and refraction and so of light. So we're seeing there's some attempt as well at interdisciplinarity there. And of course, in assessing science, we have our SBA, which speaks to the experimental skills. I spoke about process skills. And of course we have um, ORR, manipulation, measuring, drawing, and planning and design. So some ideas of design happening there, but not design that happens as we say in STEM. Our STEM definition was mentioned before, and a simpler one we might say is an interdisciplinary approach to learning that removes traditional barriers. 
that were separating the four disciplines of science, technology, engineering, math, and integrating them into real world, rigorous and relevant learning experiences for students. So that's a definition, a simple definition um, that we have of STEM. And with STEM learning objectives, again, what the objective is really on the concept, but the approach, for example, is to use an engineering design or engineering model to help students develop math or science knowledge. In this approach, one or more specific discipline within STEM, math and science is prioritized and engineering, for example, is used as a vehicle to deliver the discipline. So in that particular example, there was an eight week design unit based on science and engineering, integrating science and engineering, sorry, to have students improve their understanding of chemistry concepts, for example, energy change reactions. What students did to understand this is to complete a three phase design of a heating cooling system prototype, conceiving the prototype, developing the subsystem, presenting the design, testing, and the test then, however, focused on the chemistry knowledge, which was the intention. But we see the difference here between the original science education where there was no real STEM, um, engineering, except of course, in the ECCE and primary. We also have a STEM learning objective, which is to help students develop the skills that go beyond a single discipline. And in this perspective, a range of processes focusing on STEM indication and integration have been you have used learning tasks that are situated in the context of a complicated situation and require students to apply knowledge from various areas. For example, there's a reference to a study where an engineering design STEM based program was used to improve elementary and mathematical students level of science, engineering and mathematical knowledge. And the pretest um, develop, assess their science, engineering, and mathematical knowledge, unlike the first example where the focus was on the chemistry. Um, so it's possible to have this kind of um, assessment as well. Now, in Trinidad and Tobago as well, there was an example of the STEM Imagination Children's Conference in um, January of 2024. And we can see that these students from primary to secondary, developed, designed, tested their pro, um, prototype, and they were able to actually develop something that was really of relevance to them. So for example, lighting the classroom with alternative energy, privacy gates for a classroom, designing a bin, a noise monitor. These were the ideas that came from the children and they designed, tested, and in so doing, of course, they were learning their science as well. So STEM education, the difference is it, it, it engages with the design and technology, which is um, applicable to the engineers, the architects, all of those professions that we, the um, web designers, the creatives, all of those persons who are involved in design. Um, so it allows the students an opportunity to engage. It involves purposeful action in response to perceived need or want, so it's relevant. It's also concerned, however, with what might be. So it's also future oriented. You have to think beyond what you're experiencing. It requires individuals and groups to be creative. It involves learning through experience. And I think it was Dr. Burke who spoke about quite often through trial and error. So we make mistakes, we learn and we try again. People spoke about the aesthetics and functionality. People uh, draws upon ex, um, concepts and information from a range of subjects. And it is of course, cooperative and collaborative. So in conclusion, STEM defined as integrated and including engineering component is different from the traditional science education. Um, it starts with real world problems and requires use of 21st century skills, for example, creative thinking, people spoke about the four C's. Traditional science education, especially at the secondary level, whether monodisciplinary or interdisciplinary, tends to begin, however, with the disciplinary complex concepts, which are then applied to life situations. Working models or artifacts as solutions to real world problems are rarely produced. Um, so it's a matter of curriculum design, integrated STEM problem to start traditional science discipline center. Delivery with regard to integrated STEM, high student involvement, low for traditional. Assessment can be mixed, either based on the concept you're interested in or based on the, all of the disciplines, science, engineering, math, et cetera. So I thank you very much for listening and I will end the presentation at this point.
Thank you, Dr. Herbert. So it appears that there is a platform, an existing platform with opportunities for um, interdisciplinary approaches that we can find in the curriculum, but um, we need to jump off that platform and get more purposefully involved from our curriculum design all the way to, through delivery of the curriculum and to assessment to underscore and utilize um, what was spoken about by yourself and Professor Delisle, Dr. Nazir, problem-based, project-based, real world, um, starting with meaningful context for students, uh, development of actual prototypes, uh, so that uh, there is uh, an opportunity, but we need to action it. Um, and so maybe our next, thank you so much, Dr. Herbert, and maybe our next presenter will help us understand a little bit more about how actioning might become more of a reality. Dr. Rowena Kalu is a lecturer in science education at the School of Education, UWI, since 2015. She began her career as a secondary school integrated science teacher and has been a teacher educator for over 20 years, working at UTT and the current and Valsian Teachers Colleges. Between 2015 to 2020, Dr. Kalu facilitated a series of teacher STEM teacher of STEM teacher workshops in several Caribbean territories under the aegis of the Caribbean Association for Science and the Caribbean Science Foundation. Today, Dr. Kalu will be addressing us on the value of STEM pedagogy. Dr. Kalu. Thank you, Nalini. All right, so let me just pull my PowerPoint up. It's not coming up. There it is. Okay. One minute. All right. So I'm supposed to write coming from start. Okay. So thank you very much, Nalini. And uh, good afternoon, professors, colleagues, and friends. Well, you will be pleased to know that where I come on the program my topic has already been covered. So wonderfully, you have heard six brilliant speakers who have told you everything about STEM pedagogy. So instead of looking at STEM pedagogy, uh, we're going to instead solve some riddles. So please get ready to type in your chat. Okay, so how do we start riddles? A riddle, a riddle, a re. What gets bigger, the more you take away. Can you please type it up in the chat? Okay, next one. All right. A regular, regular re. What gets wet when drying? Okie dokie. Yes. Okay. And my last riddle, a little more tough. A riddle, a riddle, a re. You measure my life in hours and I serve you by expiring. I'm quick when I'm tin and slow when I'm fat. The wind is my enemy. Who am I? All right. Did we get this? A hole, a towel, and a candle. Yes? Okay. Right. The question I asked is, why are we attracted to riddles? Why are we motivated to find the answers? And you may have guessed that at the core of riddle solving is inquiry. Through inquiry, we do what is natural to humans, we solve problems. And we solve those problems using inferences through, using observations through which we draw inferences. Similarly, at the heart of the STEM pedagogy is also inquiry. So in the 15 or less minutes that I have, I want to, ex well, I was going to explore the pedagogy of STEM, but frankly, my colleagues have done such a good job that I'm just summarizing what they have said. I will look a little bit at the challenges of translating STEM goals into Caribbean classrooms. And even that has been dealt with to uh, a fairly good extent. And where I'd like to focus is STEM in action, providing um, my friends and colleagues here with some real life examples of Caribbean STEM pedagogies that I have been involved in. Okay. All right, so let's start. 
STEM pedagogy is built on a constructivist understanding of how knowledge is created. And to give us a sense of this understanding, I wanna give you a story of my son when he was quite young and thankfully he's not in the room right now. You know, one of the things that started happening to me was my shampoo was disappearing and I could not figure out why this shampoo was going down so quickly. I was sure that I wasn't using that much of it. And one day I walked into the bathroom and there was my son pouring the shampoo down the toilet bowl. So I said, Adrian, what are you doing? You're throwing my shampoo down the toilet bowl. And he looked up at me and he said, mommy, you know, when you pour that shampoo down that toilet bowl and you press that handle, those bubbles come all the way to the top. Well, it, you know, it stopped me <laughs> in my buff. And it brought out to me how quickly that curiosity, that sense of inquiry can get lost. And frankly, why it sometimes needs to get lost. Okay, so Henriksen and Jarrett have said that inquiry is the essence of the scientific enterprise. And when you are three, the inquiry doesn't always work in the favor of the parent, but it is inquiry nonetheless. Inquiry harnesses human curiosity. It allows learners to raise investigable questions. And his question was, which is why the shampoo kept disappearing, how much shampoo do I need to get those bubbles to rise to the top of the toilet bowl? An inquiry allows students to offer explanations based on observations and analysis of collected data. The scientific explanations derived through inquiry fuels the design of solutions for human problems. Okay, and that design of solution for human problems, as, as we have heard, is the whole process of engineering. And of course, uh, we should all be very much familiar with the design process. And Dr. Burke spoke about how the design process in the arts, which actually I think is very similar to the design process in engineering, if not the same, um, actually fueled um, that whole situation of artistic design and the integration of science, math, engineering, technology, and the arts. As we have heard before, STEM is an integrated discipline. True STEM is integrated. Through STEM, however, we develop a pedagogy based on the principles of that constructivist learning and the process of inquiry, which will fuel innovation and creativity, not just across disciplines, but throughout life. And I think that's something that we forget. Inquiry, I believe, and I will argue, acts as a unifying process which intersects all versions of STEM. So STEM, STEAM, STEM, STREAM, wherever you, you, you wish to put the integration at the heart of all of this is the human imagination, curiosity and raising questions. And as, as, a, as I illustrate from my son and his bubble experiment, this is an aid to being human, asking questions, being creative and solving solutions and begins at a very young age. So Anne Jolly, looking at the six characteristics of great STEM lessons tells us that STEM pedagogy develops a set of thinking, reasoning, teamwork, investigative and creative skills that students can use in all areas of their lives. It is not a pedagogy purely for the classroom. It is a pedagogy for life. It is a life skill. Henriksen and Jarrod describe inquiry not as a purely investigative individual function, but as occurring in communities, as learning which is built on collaboration and exchange of ideas between learners. And that's a critical aspect of inquiry that we forget, that it is not merely about, um, it's not merely about finding out, it is also about connecting. So the value of STEM pedagogy, it focuses on real life problems. So it has immediate appeal for all learners. Failure does not occur. Failure is a pathway for learning. Uh, my colleagues will know that we always start science, looking at the media of science with my students doing some activities, my teachers with their Mobius strip. And every hypothesis they make is wrong. 
right? And I ask them, why are you continuing? I mean, you all are making these dumb hypotheses, you know? And they say, Miss Curiosity, we really want to find out what is going to happen next. So failure is not an option there, right? All that failure does is lead to more questions, right? So failure as a pathway for learning. Of course, teamwork, rigorous math and science application are the heart of all STEM endeavors, community, creativity, and innovation. And my previous colleagues have discussed all of these in great detail and with great clarity. But what happens as we try to translate these wonderful noble ideas into the classroom? Here we have a couple of researchers um, outside of the Caribbean actually saying that teaching inquiry based science education, and here they're talking about science education, but you, you, you can translate this to STEM very easily, right? Requires an understanding of the nature of science, the pedagogy of inquiry and confidence in implementing implementing inquiry-based science education. Research suggests that pre-service elementary teachers lack these qualities. And if I had more time, I would cite the research within the Caribbean, which shows the difficulties that um, pre-service teachers do have in the teaching of inquiry-based science, far less inquiry-based STEM. So there are several challenges, even when teachers know um, what is involved and even when they have a commitment to inquiry and in actually translating inquiry into the classroom. Our, our education system is syllabus bound. You're either doing what is in the syllabus or you're not teaching. It is exam driven and teaching is very much linked to what is coming in, in the exam and how it is coming in the exam. And of course, exams can only um, I would say assess a certain kind of knowledge. It's based on mug and jug learning. What does that mean? Mug and jug learning. The mug has all the information and the jug has none. And what you're doing is pouring from the mug into the jug, right? And it's product oriented. So the process of learning is far less important than the product of learning, right? And that of course goes with the whole exam driven um, process that marks our system. So these kinds of constraints really do make it difficult to translate our inquiry or design or creative based um, subjects into the classroom. The Conference on Transforming CARICOM Primary School Science Education, Enhancing Innovation and Sustainable Development described the Caribbean education system as an unresponsive one. In other words, we come to these conferences, we give our grand ideas, but it does not translate. They spoke about an urgent need to demystify science and ground its pedagogy in authentic and indigenous knowledge. And, to and they went on further to say that engaging students in science should begin in the pre-primary years through the mechanism of inquiry-based science education. Now, I know we are speaking about science here, but STEM is S-T-E-M, and science is one of the core, science as math and math, as Dr. Nazir had pointed out before, two of the core subjects um, through which uh, the content and the processes of STEM become realized. So how do we do this? How do we create opportunities for STEM education in the Caribbean, given our constraints? I think the first, one of the ways that we can do this, and I suppose it comes from me being a biologist and an environmentalist, is to recognize that we have what I call a living laboratory. You just have to step out your classroom door and there's a laboratory ready for use. And it's something that we don't take advantage of. So what I want to do now is to provide some examples of some projects that I have been on and that I have facilitated, which have worked within the constraints of our education system. And in describing the projects, I hope you will see how the criteria for a STEM pedagogy 
inquiry, community, collaboration, integration, innovation, um, have all merged even within a system where resources are not readily available and where exams and the syllabi drive the process. So one of these projects was called Birds in the Schoolyard. And I did this as part of a postdoctoral master's in education with the University of Miami in Ohio. And we had to develop a project for our community, which was both inquiry-based and participatory and community-led. And I chose to work with a school in a fairly poverty-stricken area um, where students, um, were not known for high performance and uh, which, in which resources were not um, readily available. And uh, I decided to tackle the environmental aspect of the primary syllabus, but through local bird ecology. So you can see some of the kids there with their binoculars searching for the birds on the outdoors of the school. And it is interesting that when I started the project and I, I tried to sell it to the teachers, the first thing they said was, but Dr. Kulu, look at, look at our us. It's all concrete. They don't have any birds here. And I began to look up and around and there were the birds and I started to name them. They were just stopped in their part because birds are ubiquitous. So even in our most urban of spaces, there are birds, okay? All right, so in this project, I would come into the school once a week and I linked what I was doing to the syllabus, but in a very hands-on authentic way, right? So the kids did lessons on biotic and abiotic um, environments. They, they, um, they looked at food chains, they looked at bird adaptations and all of these things were linked back to the primary syllabus. So the teachers were very much sold on the project. They gave me the big auditorium to work in. And as the project went along, the teacher began to use, because the children were so enthusiastic about the work, he began to use the material they did and integrate it into language and social studies and other aspects of his class, right? Here you have the kids. Our final day was a day at Asia Ride, and that was such a memorable day because they're primary children. They don't know about cooperative work. And every day they gave me hell not wanting to get into their groups and choose their leader. And then when we reached the Asia Ride and the woman said, can you get into groups? They said, sure, you don't have to put us in groups. And they did it automatically. And they, the leader who they argued with every day was, was suddenly known and given his position or her position, they picked up their tablets and they walked around naming, identifying. I mean, Asia Wright was completely impressed with them. Here we see a wonderful design project that just needed a piece of paper. At the end of our session, I asked them to draw a playground that they and the birds could live in. And what wonderful ideas they came up with from fountains, the flowers that they saw in Asia Wright. Somebody did uh, on this one, a bird cafeteria. You can't see it well, but the bird would fly into to this building, go through the little tunnel, go up to the cafeteria, have its food, and then there was a route for the bird to fly back out. They had swings for the birds and swings for the kids. It was just a wonderful project, right? And what did the children say? Nothing hard, they liked everything, they loved the field trip the most, they loved planting the flowers, all recyclable flowers from my garden, very sturdy so they could be overwatered. Um, using recyclable materials for spots, drawing maps, and they loved me. Well, <laughs> right? And this was their pre and post test environmental attitude score. And you saw a distinct improvement in environmental attitude and sensitivity. So, one of the key outcomes that you want from environmental work. Another Another way of entering the system is using indigenous and traditional knowledge. So this is another project I did with the Santa Rosa people. And I, I worked in one of their camps. And what I did was I used their indigenous knowledge. I used their museum to teach um, or to involve the children in exploring the natural world and the technology of indigenous people weaving and uh, um, their various basket work and tools, etc. Here, the children have a 
a web uh, that they have made because on them are names of various plants, animals, biotic and abiotic um, aspects of their local environment and the web were they made by connecting to that part of the environment which supported them. And of course, we had a whole wonderful discussion on it. You could just look at their faces and see the joy, right? Another important project had to do with teachers and that's my CAS CF CSF project, which I worked throughout the Caribbean, sponsored by the Caribbean Association of Science and the Caribbean Science Foundation, um, teaching teachers about STEM through hands-on inquiry. And it is interesting what teachers wanted out of these workshops. They wanted to gain hands-on experience in teaching science. They wanted to learn techniques which were, and this is, these were their words, practical, fun, innovative, and empowering for their students. They wanted these strategies to be applicable to the constraints and possibilities of the Caribbean classroom. And they wanted to learn strategies which help to clarify concepts that they had and develop students' critical thinking. Okay, and here are the teachers at work. Here they are, you can see the collaboration. These are teachers from across several islands, eh? so they don't know each other. This is their um, solar powered hot dog maker. Here is their robotic arm made of purely recyclable materials. So the arm should have been, I think a meter long, it should pick up something as heavy as a lionfish, etc. And it was really a very exciting um, workshop, okay? This is their balloon powered car, right? This is their house frame, which is supposed to resist an earthquake made out of, um, oh, it was skewers and plasticine, right? That's the kind of work that we did. Inquiry-based, participation-oriented, teacher-centered and context-centered. Hence the kinds of low cost materials that the workshops focused on. So, when we examined the teacher's feedback, we came up with five themes. They were learning and experiencing the native science. They talked about things like the impact of ex experimentation, how it built curiosity. They learned through interaction. I really enjoyed the interactive group session. They le learning was an emotional experience, something we don't think about. Or some one teacher wrote with three exclamation marks after it. I learned that science can be fun, inventive, and challenging. Learning was empowering. One teacher said, I'm more enlightened and more excited to take what I learned and apply it to my teaching of science in my country. And they learned that that what that science and STEM was relevant to their classroom and culture. All right. Another area in which we can inter translate STEM pedagogy into the classroom is through informal science education um, or informal STEM education. So science should not be confined to schools and formal institution. STEM should not be confined to schools and formal situ situations. It can be instituted in a range of settings. So NSTA and the other researchers have said that informal science education can enrich, complement, and strengthen school science. And this is well supported by the research. And our colleagues, my colleagues have spoken about some of these initiatives, the SPICE initiative in Barbados. This is Professor Ward here who began the initiative. He's out of MIT working with these young people who have developed the most innovative of, of um, projects and he gets them internships at MIT and other places. Of course, the Nihus Shell STEM centers, the Nihus I STEM, I STEM clubs, right? Um, amongst other initiatives which translate the pedagogy of STEM into the classroom. As, my, as that project with the Caribbean teachers closed and we um, analyze their feedback. We saw that the innovation and passion of the participants, that, that is the teachers highlighted the creative potential of teachers when provided with exemplary and authentic examples of practice. And I think this was the important aspect. Pedagogy, for pedagogy to impact teachers, it must be both authentic and provide examples of good practice, right? Teachers want to see 
teachers don't just want to hear about it, teachers want to live it. Okay, so translating STEM pedagogy into practice provides a driving force of active learning, innovation, creativity, and very important, a joy of learning. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kalu. Um, really an important lesson to take away that that spirit of inquiry is something we have to actively foster, uh, not only um, at school, but then it must continue at home. So that, you know, sometimes we really as uh, um, educators, as parents, etc., we don't um, encourage, uh, you know, um, our young, our students, our future generation to, um, you know, experiment and to uh, find that problem issue that's bothering them and really, you know, work towards it despite how messy it might be or how much it might, you know, um, <laughs> require readjusting of the way that we operate. And, um, I think really too that we as educators really need to model that that spirit of inquiry and help um, to develop and foster those attitudes, uh, those interests, and those kinds of inquisitive um, feelings in our students. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalu. Um, so we're moving right along. Thank you for staying with us, audience. We just have two more presentations. We're moving straight into a presentation by Dr. Rewati Maharaj Sharma. She's a senior lecturer in science education physics at the School of Education, UWI, St. Augustine. Dr. Sharma is the current Deputy Dean of Planning and Programming at the Faculty of Humanities and Education. She has been the coordinator of the Bachelor of Education program for the past nine years. Her research interests include novel approaches in science education, science students' voices, and students' conceptions and misconceptions in science. Today, Dr. Kalu, um, Dr. Maharaj Sharma has been tasked with uh, addressing us on integrated STEM and the valued outcomes of schooling. Dr. Maharaj Sharma. Okay, thank you. Thank you so very much, um, Madam Chair. And um, I really want to commend the organizers of this webinar for the sequencing in particular, because it's well sequenced so that every presentation led or followed from the one that came before. And I feel at this point, my presentation would have significant overlap with what would have gone before. And therefore, in a sense, is a kind of a summary. But I will um, go through. It's not a very um, long presentation. So I will just go through. And um, as we have heard before in the previous presentations, a lot about what is STEM education, what is STEAM education. We have heard about the importance of STEM and STEAM education. We've heard about how critical STEM and STEAM education is in the furtherance of our society. And so therefore, for the next few minutes, what I am going to talk briefly to you about is um, attaining valued outcomes of schooling in the context of STEM education and integrated STEM education. So perhaps a fitting question at this point is what um, are our understandings of the outcomes of schooling or the valued outcomes of schooling in this case? Well, I mean, as educators, as um, practitioners in education, as teachers, we all have our own ideas and notions about what um, we think ought to be the valued outcomes of schooling. And no doubt um, in our planning and in our preparation of lessons and instruction for delivery, those um, understandings, those ideas in our minds of what ought to be the valued outcomes of schooling influence what we plan for cl or classroom instruction, what we plan for classroom delivery. So what um, really um, uh, might be our um, understandings of the valued outcomes of schooling? Well, 
Dr. Samuel Lochan, a former lecturer of the School of Education, UE St. Augustine, and I think he was on our list of attendees earlier. I don't know if he's still there. Wrote, writing in the Trinidad Guardian newspaper on June 6, 2021, which is just a few days ago, painted a picture of what um, our school systems seem to value. And he said, certificate, certification-driven education has been an existential reality that both teacher training institutions and ministry officials have sought to ameliorate, but with no success. He continues, drill and practice beat other pedagogies hands down as a school's struggle to get more children to gain top marks and to please the parents. Of course, the messaging here is that our school system seem to value certification-driven education and drill and practice pedagogies aimed at attaining top marks, students attaining top marks. So um, a question here might be for us to ask ourselves, is this the portrayal, are we comfortable with this portrayal of our education system? Well, I mean, it's something to think about going forward. But we do know that our education system is guided by sound policy documents. And an examination of some of those documents seem to suggest that the reality as described here by Dr. Lochan is in stark contrast to the underlying philosophy of our guiding policy documents. In fact, the Ministry of Education draft policy paper on the framework for the achievement of quality education at all school levels articulates that the outcomes to be achieved by learners at all school levels are healthy lifestyles, self-awareness, national pride and a sense of belonging, communication and self-expression, appropriate levels of literacy, numeracy and technological literacy, love for learning, aesthetic appreciation and expression, and an intrinsic sense of right from wrong. Furthermore, our own UE defines the attributes of the ideal UE graduate to be a critical and creative thinker, effective communicator with good interpersonal skills, IT skilled and information literate, innovative and entrepreneurial, globally aware <clears throat> and well-grounded, socially, culturally, and environmentally responsible, and one guided by strong ethical values. So recapping, we have heard so much this evening about STEM education. What are the intended outcomes of STEM education? So again, another question, how do the intended outcomes of STEM education align with the outcomes articulated in our policy documents? Well, <clears throat> we have heard that STEM education creates meaningful learning experiences. And an examination of the documents seem to suggest, or we could note, we can find it even explicitly expressed in our documents, that this particular outcome of STEM education aligns well with those outcomes captured in our documents, particularly in the UE document, Critical and Creative Thinker. And at the ministry's level, love for learning and appropriate levels of literacy, numeracy, and technological literacy. We have also heard that STEM education creates future problem solvers. And again, there is alignment with our documents, our guiding education policy documents, innovative and entrepreneurial, socially, culturally, and environmentally responsive. We have also heard that STEM challenges create confidence by working through the unknown. And again, we note good articulation between STEM outcomes and those, or intended STEM outcomes and those articulated in our policy documents. But as Dr. Lochan ha has pointed out, 
the reality leaves much, much to be desired. The reality is about certification driven education, drill and practice, quite contrary to what is expected from, from STEM pedagogy, from STEM education, and even contrary to what is articulated in our guiding policy documents. Again, something to think about moving forward. So another question therefore, and again, we have heard some of this before, how, how might we go about achieving those intended outcomes or those um, valued outcomes of schooling, whether it is within the paradigm of STEM or simply guided by our documents. Well, in the context of an integrated STEM approach, um, cross-disciplinary educator Bethany Schaefer, who is attached to both the Hilbury Academy in North Carolina and the Dr. Albert Einstein Institute in New Jersey, she has advised that there are several things that educators can do, STEM educators can do to achieve valued outcomes of learning. But she advises that there are three things that she would recommend for novice STEM educators. And I think we have seen some of these before. We have seen definitely blur the lines. I remember it from Dr. Burke's presentation and we have seen Rethink the Future. I remember it from Dr. Kalu's presentation and also I believe um, Dr. Burke's as well and even Professor Agard alluded to it. So Schaefer is advising that novice STEM educators adopt what she describes as blur the lines going beyond the iPad and rethinking failure. So what does she mean by blur the lines? Well, again, we have heard this. We have heard that STEM instruction by its nature is open-ended, inquiry-based, and problem-based. And because it is inquiry-based, open-ended, and problem-based, it can seem quite chaotic when implementing STEM instruction, STEM pedagogy in our classrooms, particularly to novel STEM teachers. Monica Foss, an engineering specialist at Cedar Park Elementary STEM School in Apple Valley, Minnesota, advises that in order to be successful in implementing STEM pedagogy in our classrooms, STEM or STEAM pedagogy in our classrooms, that teachers need to embrace this chaos. And how can they embrace this chaos? By adopting, and I think this was also mentioned, the words I remember, um, by embracing this, uh, the, the, by adopting, sorry, and it's always messy in here attitude. And teachers need therefore to let go of the idea that they must always have the answer. They must be willing to live with and navigate through the muddiness. And again, I think someone spoke about navigating through the muddiness when in STEM instruction or STEM pedagogy in the classroom. Good STEM instruction, again, we heard of this before, good STEM instruction blurs the lines between subject areas so that STEM projects can be integrated into lessons in language, culture, and history. Continuing with blurring the, the lines, we've heard again about this engineering design process. And what Monica Foss says is that the cornerstone of valued STEM outcomes is the engineering design process. We've heard about this. I'll talk a little bit about it in a subsequent slide. But what she says is because the engineering process design stands on the pillars of open-ended inquiry, problem-based, inquiry-based, because it stands on those pillars that it is quite challenging for teachers because teachers are not, well, not accustomed to embracing. It's new to them. They are not familiar. They, some of them do not know how to embrace this thing we call open-ended learning. In fact, at the STEMANISTA project at the Ford Institute in Michigan, that was, a, that was a tremendous challenge 
in that institute with that project. That was noted in the report as a tremendous challenge that teachers were, that, that embracing this open-ended learning was a challenge for teachers. Also challenging for teachers involved in that Semanista project was working collaboratively to find solutions. And we have heard this evening that one of the, um, a very important thing in implementing STEM pedagogy, in implementing STEM instruction, in achieving these valued outcomes of STEM education is working collaboratively, teamwork, sharing. So at the Semanista project, they have found that those two things are quite challenging, embracing open-ended learning and working collaboratively to find solutions. And I suspect in our context as well, that might be challenging for our teachers, even for us as teacher educators, that can sometimes be quite challenging. What is very important in order to achieve those valued STEM outcomes is that extensive and sustained planning, and again, the collaboration with teammates. Now, I think someone spoke earlier about the outcomes, about the, 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 the about specific outcomes of integrated STEM. Now, there are really no, there isn't a, an inventory per se of highly integrated STEM outcomes. You cannot go to a textbook or Google search and pull up and say, okay, these are all of the um, highly integrated STEM outcomes. You won't find that. And the reason for that is because this thing we call STEM, this thing we call STEAM that we are all trying to grapple with, to understand so that we can use it to move forward is a philosophy of education and not a program. It is a philosophy and not a program. So it is actually the what of the curriculum. And I think in some form implicitly, this was um, spoken to, uh, this was spoken about in earlier presentations. So that this STEM, this STEAM, it is not the what of curriculum, but it is actually the how of curriculum. And then the other thing that um, Bethany Schaefer speaks about is going beyond the iPad. Now, this is particularly important now, especially because with, I mean, with the way the world is now, and particularly in the COVID, um, in, in the COVID, within the COVID constraints, when you say technology to students, even for some of us, when you use the word technology, our minds begin to run to, you know, to elect, our minds begin to think or conceptualize electronic devices and apps and so on. But pretty much anything around us is technology. And she says that that is some of these, that is something that they are trying to teach kids from a very, very young age. So at the Richfield STEM Elementary School in Minnesota, Christine Aubrey, an educator there, says that everything around us was created or engineered to solve a problem. And that that is something they are trying to instill into the minds of children from a very, very young age. Technology doesn't have to be an app. Technology doesn't have to be a computer. Technology doesn't have to be an electronic device. Pretty much anything around us is technology. David Carter, who is a STEM training director affiliated with the Bernier Software and Technology, with, with Bernier Software and Technology in Tennessee, says it doesn't have to be complex, you know, but that sophisticated STEM projects can be built around simple tasks, simple tools, simple projects. And he gives an example here. So, and the example has to do with giving third graders an opportunity to create a vessel to keep water as warm as possible. So that the science part comes into play when they learn the concept of heat transfer. The engineering side involves designing the best thermos. The temperature sensor itself gives the students an opportunity to record and to manipulate data and to track their experiments and to note ways in which they can improve their designs. So this thing about technology and going beyond the iPad, it is about getting children to recognize that you are rarely using everyday real life scenarios, situations, sometimes problems and challenges to arrive at solutions and how do we go about arriving at those solutions. 
So continuing again at the Richfield Elementary School in trying to use everyday real life situations, problems and challenges and trying to orchestrate ways of solving these problems. The, at the Richfield Academy, they are teaching children using the design, the engineering design process. And so the criteria for every project there is that it must be about solving a problem, that students must apply the engineering design process to solve the problem, and that technology should be considered a resource in this process and not a subject. So for example, again, we've seen the engineering design, pro the engineering design process before. And, it, and I mean, it's about defining the problem. So you have a problem. So you want to de properly define the problem. And in order to do that, sometimes you have to do background research. And that's why there's a double arrow here, if you notice. So that sometimes the problem is obvious and you may not necessarily need to do a lot of background research to design the problem, to define, sorry, the problem. But then the, sometimes the problem is there, it's vague and you need to properly define the problem and it will involve doing some background research. So in the engineering design process, defining the problem is critical. You do your research and then another critical thing is specifying the requirements that the solution must meet. So with every problem, there might be several solutions, uh, but you need to specify those requirements that the solution to the well-defined problem must meet. And so how do you do that? You do a lot of brainstorming, e evaluating and choosing solutions. And a lot of persons have spoken about this. And this is where the teamwork and the collaboration and the sharing and the creativity and the um, critical thinking and all of that comes into play. And then having brainstormed and, and you know explored all possible solutions and so on, you develop. And again, I think Dr. Kalu spoke about this, developing and prototyping, testing your solution. If it meets the requirements, you communicate your results. If it does not meet your requirement, what do you do? You go back up. You look at where it has fallen short and you go back up to where you brainstorm and you come down the chain again. So a critical part of this engineering design process is that, and perhaps this is the most important lesson that students learn along the way when they are using the, in the engineering design process is that failure is part of the process. And that takes us into the third concept that um, Bethany Schaefer speaks about, that we need to rethink failure. While we acknowledge that the key to STEM or STEAM education is the engineering design process, we need to also indicate to students that this is the process that engineers use. This is the process that scientists use. This is the process that problem solvers use to arrive at solutions to their problems. And often engineers, scientists, problem solvers do not get it right the first time. Why? Because the learning process, the discovery process is a cycle. And so with each iteration, the design, the product or the method improves. So, with that, ha having to engage in that process, in that cycle, students are sometimes easily frustrated. They can become, depending again on their age and their understanding of what is involved and what is required. It is likely that students will get easily frustrated. And why? Because they want the answer right away. But what Monica Foss and Bethany Schaefer says is that this frustration is needed and that it is critical in fact because why this is how we all learn it is important to want the students to feel good about the experiences as they engage in this discovery process this learning process this iterative process and so on it is important for them to want to feel good about the experience but it is also okay for them to feel the discomfort that comes when something is not working
we seem to have um, lost Dr. Maharaj Sharma, um, but I think that uh, her presentation really followed very well from, um, from Dr. Kaluz, as Dr. Sharma indicated, because they both examine and acknowledge that there are constraints, there are challenges, but uh, there are also possibilities and opportunities. And inquiry-based approaches, problem-based approaches, project-based approaches are possibilities that can be employed and used by all our educators. It might require um, more collaboration. It might require deeper thought and, and planning and preparation, but it definitely is a possibility. So um, thank you, Dr. Sharma. We're very sorry that we lost the end of your very um, passionate presentation as well. So we move into our last presentation for today. Professor Delisle is Professor of Education Leadership and the current director of the School of Education at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. He earned his PhD in education from the UWI with multidisciplinary training in educational psychology, sociology, administration, and curriculum development. He has published wild, widely in international journals. He has a first degree in zoology, botany, and food technology, and a DIPED with distinction in the teaching of science. Today, Professor Delisle is going to address STEM is for everyone, achieving the equity ideal. Professor Delisle? One. Um, one of the concerns, of course, that I have is that uh, I, I do believe in the integration. Um, I am encouraging and working with um, my think tank to, to develop a, a, a IST model um, for UWI School of Education. But we need to remember that not everyone gets a chance to do uh, science in our country. And that's an issue of equity. Now, I'm an equity theorist, which means that I should understand equity well, but you are tired and I don't want to explain it. Um, so I'm just going to say that equity involves fairness. And so that if you live in... Um, the east coast of the island, you should have the same access to uh, high quality science education as if you live in the west of the country. Um, and inclusion also means that you don't have large gaps uh, between different groups. Um, all of those are uh, issues of inequity. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but your slides are not showing full screen. Ooh, okay. Yes. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Um, okay, so hmm, it did that. Okay, so I'm going to try the easiest method. And hope that you are seeing, not yet. Perfect, perfect. Oops, it was it's just perfect. It's, it's perfect, you say? It just, it was perfect, but then it, we cut to you only and we're not seeing your slides anymore. All right, so are you seeing it? Say yes. Yes, we are, yes, and thank the, you. And let's just pray it towards the end. Um, so we talk about equity and we need to talk a little bit about uh, 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 equity in, in STEM. Uh, everyone in Trinidad, they don't have access to high quality uh, 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 science and mathematics education. And that's an, an, an issue. Um, so the traditional model, we can't move from the traditional model to STEM because if you move from it, you will carry your inequity. The kind of Bible quote now about um, um, I'm whining in 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 something else and you you carry over what you do get from it so if we look at the data from pisa 2015 for trinidad and tobago and compare it with latin america countries firstly you realize that there's a gap 
between rich and poor uh, students in terms of science. And, and, and that's a very difficult gap because already the rich students are doing as well as the uh, well-developed countries, the OECD countries or Singapore. So people like, including me, we like to compare ourselves to Singapore, but the fact is that uh, we perform much lower and the gap exists. Um, secondly, there are a number of students who are not performing up to the basic benchmark. In Trinidad and Tobago, for science, it's 46%. Yes, 46. And in mathematics, I can't see it, but I know it's high. Um, it, it's high. It's 50, it's 50, 50, should we 50, 50 something, between 52 and, and, and 57. So immediately, we're getting um, an understanding of the difficulties that we do have. Yes, it's 52. So we're continuing. Gender gaps are very unusual in Trinidad and Tobago. So we realize immediately from this um, uh, the visual that, that, that girls uh, do better than boys, even in maths. But that's not so with the other Latin American countries. And uh, certainly in terms of science, we do also have the, the largest gap uh, between, between um, boys and, and, and girls. So, so, so we do have a problem in our country and the pattern is different. Um, is the pipeline leaky? I can't answer that question as yet because we don't have enough data, but we can say the, the pipeline is very selective, low quality and lacks diversity. And I can suggest that by, by, by asking you to answer the question, which you must never say aloud, who becomes a doctor in Trinidad and Tobago and why? I didn't put Tobago because, well, you know, that, that's the question. Why? What, why do we have Tobago students? So you immediately realize that there are uh, uh, issues in terms of the pattern. And when we talk about STEM, we, we need to understand that STEM comes built into it with equity, diversity, and the inclusion. I'm going a little faster because I know you want to, 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 to get at least some of the news. So there are so many questions asked. Are some boys or some girls underrepresented in STEM? Which students go to which schools and what kind of STEM opportunities do they have? What ethnicities have access to high quality STEM and STEM careers? And we don't want to, even if you give us a pattern, um, before we go into theories in the papers and big fights, how and why? Um, all that work has to be done, not by me, but somebody. Do poor students have equal access to STEM opportunities? If they are denied, how does this occur? Because that's my current theme, uh, poor students. Is geographic location a factor determining who gets to do science? So yes, so there's a lot of gas in the East Coast. Do the students of the East Coast, uh, that's the notice of all these, have access to high quality uh, STEM education? Um, when we answer the questions, we have to do something that we call intersectionality. It's not just one identity. It will be multiple identities. And we have to look at that. But in our country, school type is a factor. That's a hidden factor. It must be considered. So I don't want to go into all of this, but we need to consider that data. We try to look at some of the data, but what we're telling people is that they can't look at overall data. Because look at this page. This is what we call overall data. And when you look at it, everything seems fine. Or oh, there are lots of people uh, who, who, who do maths and computing. There are a lot of people who do science. They are a little less do technical studies. But when we, and this is the, 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 the data science term, when we drill down, we realize that it depends upon which subject. So if you talk about the natural sciences, or uh, uh, 2,600 people, yes, they are doing biology, but a much lower number will do the hard science, the physics, and that's a concern. The technical studies, are, uh, closer, more than uh, 50, closer 500 students do technical drawing, but electrical engineering tech, mechanical engineering, uh, the CXC subjects, much less. 
I can't go into much detail. Go into UE now. All right. Um, you, we have STEM faculties and non-STEM faculties. Yes, you, we have a lot of STEM students, up to 6,000 annually. Oh, that is so fine. Um, that may be a little less in the graduate uh, programs. But when we break down the faculties, we realize, firstly, that engineering, you have 1,000 uh, engineers and, and, and close to 500 at the graduate level, and you have much more uh, 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 boys, uh, men, <laughs> that women in the in engineering. So, so yes, uh, girls succeed, but we realize that in engineering and perhaps to some extent in physics, you have issues. So it'll take a lot of work, a lot of data, but we don't always have that data because the data tends not to have identifiers in Trinidad. And I can't create data that the ministry or whoever didn't create. That has to be done. So that's the future for some great researcher. We also have to think about the technical subjects. Why are we separating the, the technical subjects um, from, from STEM? Science, technology, applied science. And so we have to understand what are the barriers exist? Who are doing those particular areas? Uh, I'm being a little too passionate, right? Um, if only some students have access to high quality STEM, this is an, an issue of, of, of equity. Um, is, there, is, is there equity? And I need, to, I need for us to understand that everybody has to do science. The current vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna are messenger RNA. What is messenger already? You, you would have had to do science at least to, to, to secondary school. So we do need to get that. All right, so what are the sources of inequity? I don't know, that work has to be done, but it's about who gets to do what, and that could be a structure in the schools and the curriculum offices, and what is their experience. Before people run to the papers and, um, you, you know, um, theorize, uh, classroom processes are hidden, but they could include a number of factors, stereotypes, microaggressions, implicit bias. So teachers really have to understand how their um, certain processes get translated. And schools, we don't have one school model. We have traditional schools. We have government schools um, like, like, like San Juan and Woodbrook. We have new sector schools, which were you know, once the comprehensive, and then we have the same schools like Waterloo. Do they all have the same curriculum? Do they all have the same types of lab? If you're comfortable with that diversity, then fine. But don't expect to have a pipeline where everything is the same. And of course, parents recognize that because their choices indicate that they do understand them. Wait very, very fast. Um, if we're comfortable with having multiple pipes with different products in the pipes, then that's it, but, but don't expect to have enough for a diversified economy. I hope we won't get myself in trouble. So we need new structures and new pedagogy, as was discussed by my colleagues, my brilliant colleagues are excellent. Um, we need a greater focus on hands-on learning. We need to consider the development of what we call strong STEM identities, that students want to become um, uh, STEM workers. And then we need to strengthen this STEM ecosystem, which is why UE is intervening. UE is coming in, not just to get money, not just to, 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 to get opportunities, because UE needs to lead and UE needs to make sure that the country will have uh, workers, high quality workers in STEM. I'll go a little even faster than that. So what can we do now? Um, I, we looked at the 2018 um, plan today. Yes, we need to set system goals, but just writing goals is not enough. You must have uh, performance indicators. What do you expect to get in one year's time? Tell us so we will know and we can work towards it. We need to genuinely promote science for all and applied science. Canada's model of science, for example, is, is SCS, science, technology, and society. So we need to link science. You just do science for science sake because I like physics, I do physics. You're gonna link it to, 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 to society and technology. 
they begin to reduce the gap. What's this gap about? That you have an artisan. What's an artisan? An artisan doesn't know the science of the process. That's not the German model. That's crazy for another time. So we need to remove those mental and physical barriers to doing some as well. I'm just giving you some samples of Australia's STEM strategy. So people are planning well. This is the engineers from Australia planning. This is the US 2019 strategic plan for Congress. So I need to see that. Yes, I can see documents, but I need to see it explicit. I need to see it based on theory. I need to see it clearly. So could people have been us and say, well, we already did things, yes. But I need to see it very, very specific if we are to ensure that inequity does not occur. So always remember, in whatever we do, whatever policy we create, we need to mind the gaps. Gender, low income, ethnicity, and geographic location. We don't allow large gaps in a democratic country. Because if you allow large gaps, you create an underclass and the consequences you wouldn't like. And then make sure you're teaching STEM because don't say that, well, yeah, we do STEM and it's traditional um, drill and practice. Make sure it's engaging, inquiry on oriented pedagogy, 21st century skills, integrated equity and diversity, hands on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. You've really um, summed it up very well. And that while we endeavor to um, understand the philosophy be behind STEM and STEAM education and to build in the pedagogy and integrated approaches and it's interdisciplinary approaches, we need to ask ourselves these difficult questions. Uh, and you certainly raised them with respect to equity. So um, that summarizes our presentations for today, but I'll begin right away with a few questions, starting with you, Professor Delisle. And one of our present uh, one of our attendees would like to know if STEM is a viable um, way to address uh, um, inequity. Uh well, I mean, that's a hard question. Um, we, our system is very, has high levels of inequity. So we need to appreciate that. So when we introduce them, we can't plaster over the inequity because they will be reflected. You will see it. And so we have to recognize that when we offering person STEM, it's for everyone. So everyone needs to have at least a basic understanding of science. Um, and if, if that is for at least one science subject, or if we have uh, some, some sub STEM, for example, um, uh, craft design and technology is offered to all students in the UK. So we need to have an understanding of that. This is not about doctors need science, or engineers need science, or very bright people need science. Everyone needs it. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kalu, could you share with us uh, how STEM education can be addressed in an online environment? Okay, that's a great question. I actually saw it in the chat. And it's a very challenging one that teachers are facing now. So I'm just, I'm just gonna say how we do it in the DIPED, because I do the inquiry part of the teaching. And one of the ways that you can do it is just what I did. Inquiry is not necessarily having a lab. It's an approach to teaching and learning. So beginning with the puzzle, um, with the riddles, and having looked at the chat, you saw how that itself engaged people. But um, science online can also be taught um, using online games, using simulations. I, I would tell teachers to look at something like um, Annenberg, um, the Annenberg site. There's a wonderful walkthrough field trip where the kids can click on things and find pH, et cetera, of um, various materials. And then there is also using your everyday materials. So something like two sheets of paper and having the children drop the paper at different angles, but predicting before they do that 
what would happen. Even if you begin your lesson with simple activities like that, you are going to stimulate that inquiry-based approach and lead the students into asking questions and developing observations and making inferences. So you don't actually need um, complex equipment. I know you need it at the higher level of the secondary school, but you can still stimulate the process, the learning process with everyday materials and lots of online simulations and games which are available right now. I'm sorry, I can't go into it. Yes, very, very relevant. And especially in um, the scenarios that we are facing, but it means just looking for doable and things that we can implement right. in a small way. Thank you, Dr. Kalu. And Dr. Herbert, to round off all questions for this evening, any thoughts on how, you know, um, educators uh, in the schools can try to close that gap between STEM, STEAM classroom integration, with along with the demand of trying to fully execute the curriculum? Um, well, as um, was said, it is a philosophy. So um, if you are thinking about whatever you're doing and you're trying to find the links and the relevance, then I think, um, oh, sorry. You're trying to find links and relevance, then it will come to you in whatever topic you're doing. But of course, it, is a, it requires that you have that approach and that way of thinking about what you're doing. Um, so it's trying to find the links and the relevance among the, the various areas, the science, the math, the technology, the engineering. And it's trying to find projects that will allow for students to engage in that building of models and that hands-on kind of experience that they can test and engage in that design process. It's not something that you might be able to do on your own, but I think teamwork and collaboration and thinking with your colleagues can help. Of course, it raises issues with regard to where is the time for it. But um, again, perhaps administrators can begin to think about building in time within the, um, the schedule when people can actually meet. I remember when I was first in teaching, there was a specific period when we had what was called the science department meeting. So if that can be built in, then people can think about it and not rely just on themselves trying to come up with to create these ideas, but collaboration might help. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Herbert. And that white space that Dr. Burke spoke about. And, you know, just trying, just as Dr. Kalu just mentioned, you know, start with small things and, and you know, actively collaborate um, with your, between science teachers, math teachers, art teachers, um, everyone, so that we can get um, that collaborative effort to, to address the situation. Um, we have come to the end of our session for today, and uh, we are really um, thankful that you stayed on with us and to all our presenters who maintained their passion right up to the end, even though they had um, a long lengthy wait to, to deliver their presentation. Um, we really hope that we have raised, um, th uh, provided thought provoking stimulus uh, as far as STEM and STEAM ed education and uh, that uh, um, your takeaway can um, assist you in uh, um, trying to wrap your mind around the philosophy behind STEM and STEAM education, about ways in which it can be um, worked into our school system in, in way, looking at ways in which you can contribute to that STEM ecosystem. So as we wrap up, uh, there will be um, a link posted in the chat um, for you to provide feedback. We value your feedback. Uh, thank you for attending and staying on till the end. I'd also like to bring to your attention that another unit, the Psychoeducational Diagnostic and in Intervention Clinic, PEDIC, will be also conducting a three-part online workshop um, entitled Reading, Contextualizing the Reading Crisis. It covers topics including reducing reading loss, developing reading comprehension, and effective teacher-parent talk. The sessions are carded for January 26th, February 9th, and March 9th. So, um, 
look out, there's a link right there posted in the chat where that you can um, copy for um, to register, right? I'd like to thank everyone, all our presenters, all our attendees and our hardworking teams behind the scene from, from marketing and communications led by Ms. Main, um, Wendy Maynard and um, our internal teams at SOE and those monitoring the charts, uh, Ms. Tracy Lucas, Dr. Vivian Alexander, and Mr. William Carter. Remember to stay safe, uh, wear your mask uh, and sanitize, uh, and uh, do enjoy the rest of your evening. Pleasant good evening to everyone.